to the second hearing of the Standing Committee on Law and Justice 2022 review of the Workers' Compensation Scheme. The inquiry forms part of the committee's regular review of the Workers' Compensation Scheme in accordance with its oversight role under Section 27 of the State Insurance and Care Governance Act 2015. The 2022 review has a particular focus on the rise in psychological claims. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the lands on which we are meeting today. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the, the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Today we'll be hearing from a number of major stakeholders, including the New South Wales Teachers Federation, Lawyers Associations, Safe Work New South Wales, CIRA and iCare. I thank everyone for making the time to give evidence to this important inquiry. Before we commence, I would like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving, giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it is important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry for terms of reference and avoid, make, uh, naming, avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. If witnesses are unable to answer a question today and want more time to respond, they can take a question on notice. Written answers to questions taken on notice are to be provided within 14 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do so through the committee's staff. In terms of the audibility of the hearing today, I remind both committee members and witnesses to speak into the microphone. As we have a number of witnesses in person and via video conference, it may be helpful to identify who questions are directed to and who is speaking. For those with hearing difficulties who are present in the room today, please note that the room is fitted with induction loops compatible with hearing aid systems that have telecoil receivers. Finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing. I now work, welcome our first witness. Um, could each witness, uh, starting from my left, please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation. Uh, Kelly Marks, Research Industrial Officer, New South Wales Teachers Federation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Amber Foam, Senior Vice President, New South Wales Teachers Federation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Excellent, thank you for joining us today. <coughs> Would either of you like to start by making a short uh, statement? Thank you, I will. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and of course extend that respect to other Aboriginal people who may be present with us today. Thank you to the committee uh, for the opportunity to contribute to this mm. review, to appear as a witness and for taking the time to read our submission. Teachers as professionals take their work, responsibilities and duty of care for their students extraordinarily seriously. And in New South Wales, the work health safety conditions in their workplaces are such that thousands of teachers are so fatigued, overburdened and burnt out as a result of the abject conditions in their workplaces that their psychological health is significantly impacted by the ongoing pressures they face on a day-to-day -day basis. 
It is these very hazards identified by Safe Work New South Wales's Code of Practice, which our members and their treating doctors cite as the reason for them leaving the teaching profession. Workers' compensation claims in relation to teachers' psychosocial health continue to be significantly underreported, and there are compounding reasons for this, which I'm happy to expand on. Our members' injuries are undoubtedly caused and exacerbated in many cases by their conditions at work and the current workers' compensation processes that are causing further psychosocial injury. We are losing too many great teachers from our system because they are finally putting their own health and that of their families first. It should not and must not continue to be this way. We welcome the New South Wales Government's amendment to the Work Health Safety Regulation 2017, which gives effect to changes regarding the psychosocial risks and sees the implementation of Recommendation 2 of the Boland Review of the Model WHS Laws and Recommendation 35 of the Respect at Work Report. Effective on October 1, the amendment regulation critically inserts new provisions on the management of psychosocial risks in the workplace and are central to this committee's review of the workers' compensation scheme and rightful focus on the increase in psychological claims. From October 1, 2022, the New South Wales regulation details the employer's duties to respond to, manage and prevent psychosocial risks in the workplace and makes it explicit that a person conducting a business or undertaking the PCB, you must manage psychosocial risks in the same way that other risks to health and safety, i.e. physical risks, are dealt with under the New South Wales legislation. The implementation of the New South Wales regulation on psychosocial risks is a warning for New South Wales employers to undergo a risk assessment and review their control measures in relation to psychosocial hazards. They must, it, may, it is made clear, that they must identify reasonable, foreseeable psychosocial hazards that could give rise to health and safety risks, and they must introduce, maintain and review control measures to eliminate or minimise psychosocial risk to health and safety so far as reasonably practicable. As outlined in the WHS Act and the Department's policy, the Department has the primary duty of care as PCBU and responsibilities are defined for both the Secretary and the senior officers of the Department in this regard. The same applies, of course, to TAFE New South Wales. Both TAFE and Department of Education have failed to put system structures, policies and practices in place to date in relation to assessing and minimising harm of psychosocial injuries. The psychosocial injury rate in education in both schools and TAFE is an ongoing concern for the Federation. Safe Work New South Wales Code of Practice Managing Psychosocial Hazards at Work of May 2021 identifies 16 common psychosocial hazards at work. While all of these apply to many of our members, there are five in particular which apply to all of our members in both schools and TAFE. We cannot allow the practice of devolving responsibility for harm minimisation onto the schools and teachers themselves. The hierarchy of controls <coughs> creates a systemic approach to managing safety for our members' workplaces by providing a structure to select the most effective control measures to eliminate, to reduce the risk of specific hazards identified as being caused by the operations of schools and TAFE. This is the responsibility of the Department of Education and TAFE New South Wales in the first instance. The failure of government through the Department of Education to even acknowledge, let alone address, these foreseeable risks are consistently and increasingly resulting in psychological injuries for our members. Today, I proudly represent over 65,000 public education teachers across New South Wales. These are the very workers that our communities across New South Wales rightly rely upon to secure the educational and psychosocial outcomes for our children and young people, to do all they can to ensure that these students have futures which are happy, fulfilling 
and contribute to the economic prosperity and social cohesion of our society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start with a couple of questions and then I'll hand over to the other committee members. Um, I wanted to ask about the return to work um, outcomes. Um, we've seen the return to work rates across um, uh, so many uh, uh, parts of, of New South Wales deteriorate in recent years. Um, any observations about what might be driving that um, uh, reduction or, or deterioration in the return to work rates? Certainly. Uh, in relation to the Department of Education and Schools, it is actually um, that process that often causes a secondary injury for the worker. Uh, it is the responsibility, of course, uh, of the department to... <coughs> uh, the way, I guess the way in which the department interprets the process and applies that return to work um, uh, process means that those who are injured workers and required to return and have until they develop the capacity, of course, to return to work, to, they must go to their pre-injury duties. What happens in practice, unfortunately, is that often the cause of the injury is the <coughs> actual workplace. Uh, so the member may well be given a temporary um, placement while they uh, become uh, uh, better in terms of their health in another school. And during that time, their health does improve. But it is the Department of Education's process that they will not affect a transfer or a change of the substantive position as a result of a workers' compensation claim. That is, that they will return that teacher to the very uh, school site where the injury occurred, thus, thus often resulting in a secondary injury. It is also the case um, that many of our members will return to work uh, when they drop after 26 weeks to 80% of their PR way. They are not often well enough to return uh, but need to do so financially um, and that too is a failure of that return to work and workers' compensation process. I'd just add mm. two things that uh, the rise in psychological injuries versus physical is also having an impact on return to work yeah. uh, outcomes because it's often more more challenging, I suppose, for the employer and the and the insurer to come up with uh, reasonable adjustments in the workplace. Or I might say it's it's they 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 perceive that it's more tri tricky. But we, we believe that it's not, um, but that is definitely what is happening. Uh, the, other, the other major problem is the, which I think the Independent Review Office really goes, their submission goes really well to, is that uh, there's a lot of conflict involved in those um, psychological injury claims, mm. which means that uh, often there is that secondary psychological injury and it affects their very, very... Um, very significantly their return to work outcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, do you think that, um, have you experienced the, any increase in um, bullying and harassment within the workplace? We saw, or I, I see from Sarah's submission that they've said that that's part of the increase in, uh, in psychological claims, has been an increase in, in uh, bullying and harassment in the workplace. Is that something that um, that you can talk to or have you noticed that at all? Um, what I would say to that is that that is symptomatic of the system in which uh, schools and teachers are operating. When you have such significant hazards such as the role overload uh, and the other hazards as identified, if you manage those risks and minimise those risks, you would find inevitably that there would be less conflict because people are under less pressure. Uh, it is actually almost secondary to um, uh, that issue. The, the problem, I guess, uh, in relation to conflict in schools is that it is often incumbent um, by the department that the teacher 
resolve and the school resolve that conflict, ignoring, of course, the preconditions of those hazards in which the environment and conditions in which they're working. Uh, if you better mitigated the risks in relation to those other psychosocial hazards, uh, I am confident that we would see a lot less conflict in schools. And I'd just make the point that CIRA does work, point out work-related harassment and bullying as one of the three yeah. mechanism types, but actually work pressure is the, is the first one, yeah. which we would agree with. Um, committee members, questions? I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, you you done mentioned done. in your opening statement there were like five specific hazards. Uh, I wonder whether you could perhaps elaborate on what they are. Certainly. Um, to go to Safe Work New South Wales's code um, of practice, which of course outlines the common uh, psychosocial hazards, uh, there are five that relate to every member in schools and TAFE. And of course the others will relate to some of our settings, noting the complexity of the school system, including uh, settings such as juvenile justice centres and hospital schools and special schools, etc. And of course <coughs> our schools uh, that are the most isolated geographically. But if we go to uh, the hazard defined as role overload, it defines this as too much to do in a set time or with insufficient workers. Uh, that really goes to the heart of what is occurring in our public schools at the moment. Teachers are being consistently asked to do more with less. And with the significant teacher shortage now um, uh, upon us and uh, which has grown over the last uh, 10 years, they do not have sufficient resources. Those left in schools, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we do see a significant problem in relation to burnout and overload for our teachers, causing them, as I said in my opening, uh, to leave the profession in very significant numbers. Uh, those left are left scrambling frankly. Uh, every morning they are unaware of what their job or their role, again identified as a lack of role clarity and a lack of uh, role conflict. They do not know anymore what their day will look like. They do not know if they will be covering additional classes. They do not know whether they will be able to teach their students the lesson they prepared the night before. Uh, because, of course, they may well have to undertake minimal supervision. Uh, this is creating significant hazard uh, and, frankly, um, a further hazard as identified by Safe Work New South Wales, of course, um, are within that role conflict and uh, lack of role clarity. Safe Work New South Wales identifies tenure and that tenure uh, goes to the significant numbers of and rise of temporary and casual teachers, both classifications of casual employment in New South Wales public schools. Not knowing whether or not you will have a job uh, next term or next year is identified by Safe Work New South Wales as being a common psychosocial hazard. Uh, these are all integral mm. to the work of teachers. Further, the conflict, um, as defined earlier, uh, and the low job control are also matters that face our teaching members every day. The, the pace and nature of reform in New South Wales education means that people do not know what is coming next there is no consultation with the worker. There is no assessment of what work will be taken away in order, um, in order to accommodate the new priorities of the government. If I could just go to one example, uh, a recent one around attendance. Now, no one would question the significant focus of the government and the Department of Education on targets for attendance. I think we could all agree, certainly teachers would, parents and yourselves, I'm sure, of the critical nature 
of increasing attendance for our students in schools. But to give you an idea of what that sort of announcement or that sort of reform means to a classroom teacher and the way in which that responsibility is devolved looks like this, where principals are required to lift their attendance targets. They will contact, as we've been made aware, teachers and they've asked every teacher who has a student who has been absent for three days or more to contact that parent because, of course, it is the teacher, in fact, who has the relationship uh, with the student and often their parents. But while that is a very uh, valid target to have, uh, it is quite common in many of our settings for that teacher to have five, six and seven students in their class who may well fall into that category. Uh, that would be a 10 to 15 minute conversation with each parent about that so, so with no additional time. So, so you see you have a, a, a valid government reform but <clears throat> no accommodation in relation to the workload and the additional task uh, that that requires for the teacher and the time that it takes to do it. But Council question, sorry to interrupt you. So. So, so who did it fall on before? Did it fall on to the, the administration of the school used to do that before? That's what I... Excellent. Okay, so... Yeah, sure. So previously, uh, in the introduction of local schools, local decisions in 2012, which was a devolved model, which basically absolved the centre of responsibility and pushed it to the local school, uh, that previously would have been done by central uh, consultants and specialists who would undertake that work. That work now uh, is being foisted onto schools and teachers, valid as it may be. Uh, but it is just a very small example of how reform so, actually reaches so the classroom. Has there been any change? So now that a teacher contacts the parents or the students versus the administration process uh, previously, what's the end result? Is there improvement or there's no improvement? Okay. Just, just for the benefit of the committee, that's all. A absolutely understand that. Um, we do have, as you would understand, the department has systems in place that monitor student attendance. And of course, um, we believe that centrally, the Department of Education could undertake that work. Um, that it's that teachers do not have the time, even though it is a very worthwhile activity, uh, all of their activities are worthwhile. They just don't have the time to be able to incorporate that additional workload into the day. Um, noting, of course, that teachers are doing between 50 and 60 hours of work per week. That is not only evidenced by the Gallup inquiry, but also by AITSL's Australian Teacher Workforce yeah. data, uh, also the government's ITE review, and of course, New South Wales government parliamentary processes themselves. There is no capacity to take on additional load <coughs> without taking significant amounts of work away. That is exactly the hazard that has to be assessed, mitigated against and controlled. We are just not in a position, no matter how valid No, uh, no, I, I, I understand what, you, what you're saying. I understand about the workload. I understand that. I'm just trying to understand, was there any benefit or in when the teachers contacted the parents directly of their students, was there a benefit of getting those students back into the classroom versus, say, when they used to go and see the principal in the old days? So what, is, is there a difference? Uh, you, look, you would have to ask the government that's, that's about how it's increased attract uh, the data they collect on the increase in attendance. I, so, I, I, I understand the work by the teachers. Question oh. as well? Yeah. So, sorry, just while we're addressing um, the, the uh, question of the Honourable Lua Mato, um, in relation to what the government is doing, the government is actually putting in place uh, a number of uh, processes, are they not, in order to relieve uh, the workload on teachers through the administrative tasks? Is that not correct? Oh, um, thank you very much for going to that question. Um, I think the um, latest announcement uh, that goes to uh, additional release uh, the Minister's own words, significant reform, 30-year curriculum reform, that's an additional 
load, I'm sure we'd all agree with that, uh, six minutes per day, if you're lucky, you've been given for that enormous, and to the government's own words, greatest reform in 30 years, six minutes. Uh, so no, uh, that will not lead to a reduction in workload. Uh, other issues such as the Quality Time Action Plan, I think may be in part what you're going to. Um, I think if you ask teachers whether some of the measures, including increasing the size of a teacher's inbox, assisted teachers in reducing their workload, uh, it would be an emphatic no. None of the measures that have been put in place or have been slated to put in place have actually saved teachers any time. When you say, though, six minutes per day, it's really not six minutes per day, is it? Because in reality, what these things are, I mean, you could you could break it down and say it's, you know, it's one minute per hour or it's, you know, you, you can find, but effectively that's 30 minutes every week that's allocated in order to, um, you know, when you're talking about the collective. Is there a question? Thank you, Mr. Adam. Um, there will be. Um, when you're talking about the collective, though, that, you know, you put the six minutes together um, over a week, that's half an hour. So it's actually half an hour in the week when you put it collectively together to focus on a task. Now, that is significant, is it not? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, not when teachers are working between 50 and 60 hours per week. Just reminding, of course, the committee that that is additional load. That does not take into consideration the 50 to 60 hours they're already doing. So no, uh, that will not be felt by teachers. To understand what curriculum reform looks like for a teacher, it is collaboration, it is planning, it is new documentation, it is the new development of resources, it is talking with other stage colleagues. It is a very in-depth process. The greatest reform in 30 years requires significant investment in professional development for those teachers. Uh, no, half an hour will not do that. It will not even come close to the work that a new syllabus requires, particularly a syllabus that is a 30-year shake-up uh, as, as stated by the government. Can I just ask, so uh, you mentioned the code, uh, you also mentioned the change to the regulation. Uh, both of those uh, measures have clarified obligations that already existed really, that, that the PCBU already had those duties. Uh, this just cl gives clarity. Can you perhaps uh, talk us through the approach that's taken in the department to assessing psychosocial risks in the workplace? Is there any processes that have been put in place that are effective? Uh, there are not, unfortunately, any processes that have been formally put in place. If I make um, comparison with the Work Health Safety Act in relation to physical injury, um, <clears throat> all employees of the department are well aware of their obligations in relation to that. And the reason why they are well aware is because there were very clear sets of time where teachers uh, within school hours <coughs> were provided with the training. There was very clear processes in relation to the system and its responsibilities in responding to that. What we have at the moment uh, is a hodgepodge, I guess, of responses. Teachers have reported consistently to us that they have rung the incident hotline in relation to uh, the department's Work Health Safety and Wellbeing Directorate, and they have been told, no, that's not an injury. Mm. So even those uh, workers within the department are unaware of the psychosocial um, impacts. Of course, uh, we were given, if, if uh, you could suggest that this might be support in term three, week nine of 2021, after what was a significant period of lockdown. Um, everybody was at home uh, working and learning from home, particularly in relation to the <coughs> LGAs. The department put online for teachers after hours a webinar a webinar called How to Struggle Better 
for its employees. That is what we get from the government and the Department of Education in relation to addressing teacher wellbeing. They don't recognise, uh, they don't address it, and they certainly don't mitigate against it. In the uh, Safe Work New South Wales's uh, code of practice, you'll see that there's a scenario there that relates specifically to school and education, um, and they go quite clearly to the hazards quick. and risks. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, the controls that are required and how to review and improve those. Uh, that has been available to the government and, and the Department of Education since May 2021, and absolutely uh, no nothing Cap has come forward in relation to that, despite the fact that the government is well aware that teachers are leaving as a result of the significant pressure, uh, the psychosocial harm that they are now experiencing every day. And if I can just um, uh, go to the, the code of practice on page 15, there's a comprehensive uh, risk management process. And, uh, you know, I can pretty much safely say that for physical hazards, uh, the department and TAFE uh, do this process uh, in, in a large in the large majority of cases, and their staff, their employees, are well versed in in those processes, uh, which includes the the um, uh, identifying the hazard, controlling the hazard, and then reviewing. I can't say the same for psychological hazards, and I, I, I agree with you. That's despite the fact that health in the Act has always been defined as physical and psychological health. But having the codes of practice, there's been codes of practice for physical hazards, asbestos, um, you know, for specific things like that, which helps employers and workers to understand their, their obligations. Uh, but that's why the, we've been saying for a number of years, including in our submission to the Boland Review of the Model Laws, that we believe that a psychological regulation uh, would provide more clarity, more detail, just as those ones about, for example, uh, election of HSRs, that's also in the Work Health and Safety Regulation 2017, which provides more detail for employers. Uh, so we're very pleased that first there was the Code of Practice, which provides a lot of guidance uh, for employers and also guidance for inspectors, for Safe Work New South Wales inspectors to come along and find out and ins inspect and inquire into what sorts of processes have the department and or TAFE New South Wales put in place. I'll just go also to um, another page, which is the page 17. Um, this is really important because it's about systematically collecting and reviewing the available information and data. And it includes things like absenteeism, turnover, exit interviews, sick leave data and workers' compensation claims. That, that type of a process, I do not believe, uh, has been occurring in a systematic way. Um, but we hope that this regulation uh, that came into effect on 1st of October 2022 will be uh, a real, um, you know, it will instigate further. Uh, it will certainly be attempting to um, negotiate such. Um, we have sort of run out of time, but maybe very quickly. On notice. Yeah, but maybe on notice. Before yeah. I shadow this, um, and listen, we could spend more time. I'm sorry that we're um, really going through this uh, far too quickly. So thank you for your submission and your evidence today. Um, on notice, because we just can't deal with it in the time available, um, the, uh, the New South Wales Teachers Federation has uh, membership in, in primary schools, high schools and TAFE. I'm wondering on notice... Thematically, uh, I presume that some of the matters you've raised today uh, run through each of those three cohorts of teachers, uh, those who teach in primary school, those who teach in uh, high school and those who teach in TAFE. So there would be some issues that I would think run through. But then with respect to each of those cohorts, there, there may well be, from a psychosocial point of view, some different issues. Uh, that, that impact on teachers. I'm wondering on notice if you'd be able to sort of make, if, you, if you're able to do so, some based on the, the data that's come in to your workers' compensation offices and, and related offices in the union, um, a, a breakdown of what are the thematically the ones that are consistent across the three and ones that perhaps are, are particularly we could have a shot at that. unique. Yeah. Yep. As best you can. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Wes, do you have one on notice I just, as well? well just, it's a very quick question, but. Um, Noting the uh, the criticisms today of the government, um, would 
you be able to identify, and, and look, I judge people on not only uh, how they can provide criticism, but also when they can acknowledge that things are going well. What does the government do that is um, of benefit in this space? Um, is, there, is there a number of things that you believe that the government is doing well? Certainly, uh, in my opening, mm. I welcomed the New South Wales government's amendment to the Work Health Safety uh, Regulation 2017. That was one of the first things I did. Uh, so, yes, we acknowledge that your government were the ones who instigated uh, this regulation and we look forward to seeing its, its uh, effects in our workplaces to minimise the psychosocial damage um, that is occurring frequently for our members. And we look forward to the resourcing of the regulator to, um, mm. to, compl to ensure that there is compliance with it. Perhaps on notice you might be able to provide to us any other uh, further um, uh, programs that the government has uh, instigated that, that you believe are uh, of assistance to teachers in this space. It would be a short list. <laughs> <laughs> And this, is, and this is the point that I was trying okay. to... Okay, all right, yeah, we, okay. we do need to wrap up. So thank you for attending this hearing. Our committee members may have additional questions, because um, there are so many, uh, for you after the hearing. Thank the committee so, has so resolved many. that the answers to these questions, uh, along with uh, any uh, answers to questions taken on notice today, be returned within 14 days. The Secretariat will contact you in relation to these questions. Thank you so much for your attendance today. Thanks. Thank <laughs>and swear either an oath or an affirmation. Yeah, my name is Shane Butcher from the Australian Lawyers Alliance. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. My, na my name is Tim Concannon. I'm chair of the Injury Compensation Committee of the Law Society. Um, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. My name's Elizabeth Welsh. I'm the Deputy Chair of the Common Law Committee of the New South Wales Bar Association. And I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Excellent. Would any of you like to start with a short opening statement? Um, I would like to, first of all, make the apologies of Mr Sheldon SC, who can't be here with us today. Um, he's in court this morning. No worries. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today on behalf of the New South Wales Bar Association and for the opportunity to make an opening statement. A focus of this review is psychological injury. In our submission, we make the point that, the psycholo that psychological injury should be treated no differently for the purposes of receiving lump sum, a lump sum for whole person impairment to a physical injury we also welcome proposals to improve the claims experience of those who claim psychological injury at work. In relation to Section 11A of the Workers' Compensation Act, which is a defence which restricts the recovery of compensation when it relates to um, a reasonable action by an employer in relation to promotion, demotion, disciplinary action, we say that not enough has been done to identify when it's appropriate to deny a claim on that basis. I would like to make some observations about how disputes are resolved. 
once upon a time, every workers' compensation claims file contained a report of injury form signed by the worker and an employer's report of injury form signed on behalf of the employer. These documents no longer seem to exist. Those contemporaneous documents have always been regarded as important where a factual dispute has arisen between the parties about liability for a claim. Their absence creates a fundamental problem should there be a dispute. To quote Her Majesty the Queen, recollections may vary. In those instances, documents such as signed reports of injury and incident reports carry significant weight. Where a member must decide who is telling the truth, being in the same room as all of the participants in the hearing is absolutely necessary. The digital age has provided enormous benefit to society. However, in many aspects of life, the old way is the best way. A hearing in the Workers' Compensation Division in the Personal Injury Commission will determine the question of whether an injury was caused by a particular event. There may then be a second dispute resolution process conducted by a medical assessor to determine the degree of an injured worker's whole person impairment. That two-stage process permits the issues in dispute to be identified at an early stage and for an adjudication of those precise areas of dispute. In the Motor Accident Division, that first step does not take place. It is just the claimant and a doctor doing the best they can. We commend, in the future development of the Personal Injury Commission, a move to the workers' compensation model for dispute resolution in motor accident cases. Finally, it's noted that plans are underway to review and redraft the Workers' Compensation Acts. It is quite a task. We look forward to assisting in that endeavour and would welcome the opportunity to review the bills when they are available. Given the breadth and complexity of the legislation, we are of the view that it should not be rushed, allowing the parties time to properly engage where necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no further opening statements? I'd like to make a sure. statement. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting the Law Society to give evidence at today's hearing. I'm representing the Law Society today in my capacity as Chair of the Injury Compensation Committee. Um, the 2022 Workers' Comp Compensation Inquiry takes as, a, as its focus psychological claims. The Law Society refers to the figures quoted in our submissions, which support the contention that over the last 12 to 18 months, the number of psychological injury claims has actually decreased compared to the 2021 financial year. Um, the figures quoted by the government in answer to supplementary question 103 following the budget estimates hearing on 30th of August 2022 supports this observation that the number of psychological uh, claims have actually steadied of recent times. Uh, accordingly, the Law Society does question the conclusion that there has been a significant increase in psychological injury claims in very recent times but, it, but if one accepts that there has been a longer term trend of an increase in such claims, then we suggest the Standing Committee consider the management of psychological injury claims. We recognise the importance of effective case management to support injury recovery, particularly in respect of psychological injuries uh, and in respect of return to work. In the experience of our members, where a worker has suffered a significant psychological injury, it can take upwards of one year for the worker to be referred to a specialist case manager. In our view, it is critical that significant investment be made in developing and educating specialist case managers to deal with these types of claims. In addition to our discussion of psychological injury, the Law Society submission emphasises the several long-standing long aspects of the scheme that we consider demand the Standing Committee's uh, attention. Uh, firstly, we draw attention to the need for comprehensive examination of the Workers' Compensation Scheme legislation. This was recognised in the Eye Care and St State Insurance and, Gov and Care Governance Act 2015 Independent Review, known as the McDougall Review, which recommended a suitable agency or body conduct a review and reconciliation of the Workers' Compensation Act 1987 the Workplace Injury Management and Workers' Compensation Act 1998 and the State Insurance and Care Governance Act 2015 into a single consolidated piece of legislation. We understand that preliminary discussions are being conducted around such a policy initiative and ask that the legal profession, which has a deep knowledge of the operation of the scheme, be consulted at the earliest opportunity. Our submission also emphasises the importance of expanding access to commutations. Our view is that there should not should be no restrictions on the type 
of claims that are able to be commuted. We consider that any restrictions should not be based on the type of claim, but rather on whether it is in the best interests of the injured worker to commute their compensation payments. Accordingly, uh, we accept uh, that there are uh, that the uh, that uh, the obtaining of independent legal advice and the approval of the Personal Injury Commission are appropriate safeguards to protect workers. As regards the assessment of entitlements to weekly and medical expenses, uh, the Law Society has expressed the view that linking eligibility for medical benefits to the degree of whole person impairment, in addition to the cessation of weekly payments, is problematic and results in many injured workers not being able to access the benefits they need to return to work or to recover. Consultation is required as soon as possible to <coughs> develop a replacement threshold test for entitlement to weekly and medical benefits that more accurately considers the need for compensation. On the issue of legal costs, the Law Society notes the regulated fees under Schedule 6 to the regulation have not been reviewed or revised since October 2012. We consider it is fundamental for the regulation to reflect the commercial reality of costs incurred. We submit that at as a minimum, Schedules 6 and 7 should provide for indexation in accordance with CPI as occurs in the Motor Accident Scheme. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity for the Law Society to give evidence today. Mr Butcher, any <coughs> opening yes. statement from you? Yeah, yeah the, the ALA, ALA thanks the committee for the opportunity to appear at today's hearing. As an organisation that focuses on the rights of the injured, we can offer valuable insights to the committee on the broader impact of policy decisions on injured workers. With respect to psychological injuries, there are two things I would like to comment on that both arise out of information that has recently been published. Firstly, with respect to the increase in claim numbers, I'd like to draw your attention to the recently published answers to supplementary questions provided to budget estimates by Minister Dominello. In particular, the answer to question 103 that sets out the number of primary psychological injuries reported from July 2011 onwards. When you compare the first 12 months of that reported data, July 11, 2011 to June 2012, to the corresponding months in the last year of reporting, there has been, by my math, only a 4.25% increase in primary psychological injuries with the normal insurer over 10 years. Self-insurers saw a de decrease in claims lodged. Now, there has been an overall increase across the whole data set with the biggest increases with the TMF which one might expect with extra strain on hospitals, police and other emergency services that you might come with managing a global pandemic. A quick Google search will also reveal that according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics between 2011 census and the 2021 census, the Greater Sydney population grew by 14% and the rest of the state grew by 8.6%. The submission of the ALA was the effect that this committee should be examining closely the data of the growth in claims that has been provided to it. It seems to me that these answers to budget estimates reinforces that submission. My second point is in relation to how psychological claims are managed. It is the ALA's firm belief that the manner in which claims are currently handled, the conduct of the investigations, and the manner in which they are disputed all lead to unnecessary harm of the injured person. The ALA submits that there is much work to be done in the regulatory space by CIRA and the operational space by the insurers, and in particular, the nominal insurer. It was only two years ago that this committee took a close look at the treatment of at least four individuals, three employees of Corrective Services, whose claims were managed by QB, and the case of Chris McCann, a former employee of iCare. These four cases were a shining example of how not to manage claims. I read the transcript on the first day of hearings of this review with interest and saw that the, there are a number of questions directed to witnesses to elicit a view on the manner in which psychological claims could be managed and improvements that can be made. It appears that iCare was listening too, and on 6 October 2022, they made an announcement about the selection of six claim service providers to manage claims for the normal insurer and laid out their plans for what appears to be a new, new claims model to managing psychological injuries. The ALA agrees that there should be more specialised response to the management of psychological claims, and that if done correctly, has the potential to provide real benefit to injured workers. However, I don't think it's unfair to say that both stakeholders and the public have been critical of iCare in the past for the manner in which they have rolled out large projects. When they appear before the committee today, I urge you to question them on why you should have faith that this new, new claims model will work. And finally, 
I urge you to continue to examine and probe CIRA and eye care in relation to the deteriorating return to work rates and what's being done about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just start with a, a question from me and then I'll hand over to my colleagues. Um, <coughs> uh, you're probably across a fair bit of the detail in the McDougall review. Um, just wondering if you think that they were good recommendations that were, um, that were put forward in the McDougall review and um, I know that the, the government's in the process of uh, of implementing them and rolling them out. Um, any observations or thoughts on um, on the McDougall uh, recommendations that are slowly being implemented? I think a lot of the recommendations um, are, are very uh, are supported by the Law Society, if not all of them. Um, the ones that we would particularly be concerned about uh, are the ones to do with uh, investigating the whole person impairment threshold and the, the extent to which that is fair or otherwise. Um, we haven't heard, uh, regrettably, uh, very much on that uh, aspect, so hopefully um, that will come up soon. Um, settlement of claims, I, I note that was, uh, that that be looked at as well was a, a key recommendation, but uh, uh, we recognised that that was part of legislation that was brought before Parliament early this year. Um, but that's, uh, that was withdrawn uh, because of uh, further need to consult with stakeholders, uh, so including the Law Society. Um, you, you know uh, from our submission that our, our argument is that there really shouldn't be any restrictions on commutations uh, other than those associated with the well-being of the worker in terms of legal advice and obtaining approval of the Commission. Um, so. Um, that is certainly something that needs further work on and we reject any proposition that uh, there should be further restrictions placed on commutation uh, that uh, uh, other than those two restrictions that, that uh, the Law Society has al already outlined. Any other We don't thoughts? really see the need to interfere with any of the um, workers' comp thresholds in terms of physical injuries. Um, the, we've <coughs> only recently through the 2015-2018 amendments had the worker with highest needs come down to 20%. Uh, that was a recognition that that was too high. Um, the 15% whole person impairment threshold for a common law damages claim is well understood and seems to catch people on the right side, whether they be over or under that threshold, so we don't see any need for that to be revisited. Um, and otherwise, I think we're waiting to see um, a bill in relation to commutation. Um, that, that no doubt will be in implemented once the details have been sorted out. Okay. The ALA, ALA supports the McDougall Review. Um, in particular, recommendations 37, 38 and 40, which have been touched on by uh, Mr Concannon. Uh, we say that they should be pursued as, as soon as possible to be implemented. Mr Fang? Could I ask, do you have a view as to why there's perhaps some discrepancy in the evidence that we've heard around um, uh, psychological claims and uh, I guess the evidence that's being put forward today about um, the number of claims? Um, do you have a view as to why there might be, I guess, a, a view that's perhaps different to some of the evidence that, that you're able to provide now? I think there's got to be some kind of differentiation between the number of claims increasing and the cost of claims increasing. Just because the costs may be increasing, that could be because of poor claims management, resulting in lower return to work rates, people being on the system longer, costing the scheme more money. Um, it could be a result of increased in benefits that have been implemented by legislation or, or through case law. But uh, you know, our submission that the ALA wrote was, was clear, be careful about looking at this data because it seems to be coming inconsistently and on the heel of the hunt. We've been quite critical of return to work rates over the last number of years and uh, if, if they are contributing to this problem, then that should be addressed. Yeah. Some of the, um, I'll say, employer uh, advocacy, you know, for example, we just heard from the, the, the teachers' union um, prior to the evidence you've given now, um, and they certainly had a view as to uh, the number, not only not only the cost, but the number as well, um, which seems to uh, not be supported by the evidence you put forward now. 
that, that, that discrepancy, um, do you have a view as to, is it um, just that there's perhaps more discussion about it and the prevalence and the fact that we're talking about it makes people more open to it and therefore that discussion makes people feel as if it's being uh, uh, got a greater focus on it? Or are there other factors? Are there perhaps less in other areas that means that the numbers are uh, static? Some areas are going up, some areas are going down. We tried to come in and listen to the evidence of the previous witnesses. We had we didn't appreciate we could come in. I, I don't know what went wrong, but so I, I don't act exactly know what you're talking about um, in terms of what the submission that they made. Um, there's usually a number of factors involved in any of these particular numbers. Mm. Um, I don't know whether it's a response to people feeling that they're stressed at work or that you know they're under pressure at work. They're as opposed to actual claims, mm. but they're in their ex those teachers' experience of what's happening at work. They may be feeling that things are worse than they used to be, or they're under particular pressures. I don't know how that translates into the discussion about the claims per se. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'm trying to. I'll, sorry, I'll just put some more context, and maybe you can provide some elucidation to that. I guess when I'm looking at um, the discrepancy between the evidence uh, that you know, employer groups are saying that they're you know they're they're seeing, feeling, observing this huge rise in in um, uh, uh, mental health condition claims through workers' comp. Um, that that's the evidence that's been given to us over a couple of days. However. The claim numbers, as you've said, are, you know, relatively stable. So it, is it that one group has actually got more claims where the other group has perhaps got less claims? Um, or that um, they're being described as a, a mental health condition but are actually being claimed under other things? For example, they might have fallen off the ladder, um, hurt themselves. They feel that, you know, that, that stress has actually been a, a mental uh concern to them, but they're being claimed under, you know, a physical injury. I'm just trying to get a picture as to uh, when these cases are coming through um, legal avenues to a claims um, uh, hearing or uh, arbitration, um, can you perhaps provide some eluc elucidation to that? Well, we, the, the purpose of my opening statements about the old-fashioned way of doing things was that you had some documents early on which nailed down the dispute and you could work from those to identify if there was a dispute. And it's more stressful at the beginning for people for things to be investigated, but that should be done once and be done properly without being any more intrusive than it has to be for any of the people involved. And then it shouldn't be revisited again. Like claims officers should not be asking people to tell them what happened to them when they're ringing up to check in on them because that's just going to put that person right back where they were on the day they walked out of work and it could put them back beyond square one in terms of forgetting about it because what these people need to do is forget about it for a while, get their equilibrium back, recover from their injury enough to go back to work. So, um, and that's stressful for the employers as well. I mean, it's very, it's very disruptive in the workplace and... We've just had three years of a significant period where people couldn't even go to work because it was dangerous to go to work. So everyone's probably got heightened anxiety at the moment. Mm. Maybe it's not the best time to be looking at this question in terms of is there an explosion of psychological injury claims. Maybe that just needs to be left for a little while just to see how things land post-COVID mm. and try getting the claims officers to have a slightly different approach to things, give people that bit of space and then have a look at it again in the next review. I'll just also point out that um, a lot of the figures that we're seeing in terms of an increase in uh, psychological injury claims stem from the period uh, where uh, EML was the sole uh, insurer and there have, as you probably know, been significant criticisms made of that uh, process uh, in terms of, and in case of psychological injury uh, claims, um, that... Uh, psychological injury claims haven't been scrutinised perhaps as, as, as well as they should have been. Um, this is only my personal comment, but I wonder whether or not that might be an explanation, partial or otherwise, for the surge uh, in psychological injury claims during that earlier period, which would be consistent with the fact that 
there has been somewhat of a drop off over the last 18 months, let's say, uh, on my review of the figures and the number of psychological injury claims. Mm. Mr. Donnelly? Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Walsh, in your opening statement, <coughs> um, excuse me, uh, if I understood correctly your submission, you um, uh, raised a, a question um, about uh, employee or worker employer documentation uh, around the incidents. Yes. And um, uh, specifically, uh, it does not appear that that documentation um, exists. I think that might have even been your word or doesn't appear to exist, yes. Um, I'm wondering, can you elucidate on that because particularly with an injury like a psychological injury, mm. uh, uh, not, not that there's any uh, uh, more or less significant than a physical injury, to actually not have um, that documentation which is taken in a, in a comprehensive form at the commencement of the whole process seems to be an extraordinary situation. Well, I first started looking at workers' compensation files in about 1985, and right up until now, as a law clerk, as a solicitor, as a barrister, right up until now, as soon as I get a brief, if it's a work injury, first thing I go looking for is the claim form and the employer's reported injury. And I've been finding that I can't find them anymore. They don't ex I've been told they don't exist it's done on a very informal level. So a claim can... Sorry, can I just press you further? Just to sorry, interrupt. When you, when you say you've been told or yes. been informed they no longer exist, yes. who has told you that? My solicitors. There right. is no claim form. It was done by an electronic notification. Right. So you haven't got anything. So then you start looking at the medical records to see where there's a history. And they're not going to be very good either. There might be a record of a conversation on the file with a claims officer at some point, which is the claims officer writing down what's said in the telephone conversation, I guess, but not those initial documents, which... There's no statutory or regulatory requirement for the format for a claim to be initiated? Well, I'm sure there is, but it appears to be satisfied by an electronic notification process as opposed to a document, as there is in the Motor Accident Scheme, where there's a claim form, you have to write down what your injuries are, you have to write down what happened to you, you have to sign it, you have to give it to the insurance company. I don't see them. Just with my colleague following up, the, 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 the electronic notification... Yes. Uh, are you able to elucidate on, on what that looks like, the detail contained within it, or that's not a level of detail It's not a level with? of detail I that's have, right. yes, and I'm right. not seeing a, something that looks like a standard document. No, ah, OK. Yeah. Well, sorry, and could I just go... I, I take it from your evidence for the committee, uh, through your opening statement, that <coughs> you do agree with the proposition that that's uh, potentially quite problematic if at that early point there is not the collection of, of some, as best can be understood, accurate detail from both the employee and the employer's point of view around the matter of the, the cause or the, 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 the factors associated with it. Totally yeah. agree. Um, Mr. Dion? Yes, I wanted to, I suppose, uh, it's a lot of assumed knowledge uh, when uh, uh, participants come before this committee and uh, uh, for practitioners who are immersed in this stuff daily, uh, it's, you know, you've got a, a very good knowledge the committee perhaps not as strong a grasp. I wanted to ask about uh, whole person impairment uh, and but particularly about the relevance of that system for assessing a psychological injury. I mean, I don't really understand what a 15% whole person impairment looks like for someone who's got a psychological injury. What is it? What does, what does that mean? People are assessed for whole person impairment for psychological injury under something called the PIRS, and it's a it's a activities based assessment that comes under six different categories, including this won't be precise concentration, persistence, and pace, adaptation, self care, um, ability to travel, and there are two other headings. I think employability is, is another one. Well, I think adapt anyway. I think. That's the, the framework of it, and they're given a score 
under each category and there's an accumulation of the score which produces a whole person impairment. So it's meant to be a holistic approach that looks at how you're functioning in six different ways mm. in which a person has to be able to function in life to produce this whole person impairment assessment. So and what you would pick you... the three in the middle uh, as the determinants of... So you can have an outlier or two uh, which get disregarded in terms of that whole person impairment rating and out of those six. Um, so there's a, there's a uh, difference, isn't there, between uh, physical injuries, uh, the whole person impairment threshold, and psychological. So yeah. what's the difference between a 10% and a 15% Well, there's a difference. there's a difference... Um, for a Section 66 lump sum, which is the point that we pick up, mm. but it's the same threshold of 15% whole person impairment for a claim for damages. So the, only, the distinction between physical and psychological at the moment is just for whether you get a smaller lump sum at workers' compensation for your impairment. And you don't at workers' comp at the moment for psych psychological harm if it's 10% or less. So I think there's a submission, your submission, isn't it, Mr. Concannon, uh, about reducing the threshold to 10% for uh, access to the common law, is it? Oh, I'm sorry, oh, I said that wasn't ours. I yeah. think that was the yeah. No, it's 15%. It should come... Physical is 10% for Section 66 and 15% for common law, whereas psychological is 15% for both at so the moment. I suppose what I'm trying to get to is uh, how do we make an assessment about whether that's a good suggestion if we're not clear about the distinction between... Can I perhaps clarify? Um, it, in terms of the methodology, you asked a question about how they compare the physical and psychiatric methods of impairment assessment. Generally, the physical methods of assessment of impairment are based on so-called objective criteria, stuff like a loss of range of movement. Uh, there are certain diagnoses, if reached will give rise to an automatic whole person impairment rating. Um, but in the case of the psychiatric impairment rating scale, scale, there's a certain element of subjectivity uh, associated to that assessment. Um, because, uh, I suppose because the psychiatric condition is not capable of any precise and objective uh, quantification. That's always been a problem, I think, with the, the uh, use of the psychiatric impairment rating scale because it does have a greater level of subjectivity to it than the, than the physical uh, uh, methodology. So is it your view that the, the, that system is perhaps ill-suited to the psychology or is it something that well, you think... It, it's one of the few that really is available, on the, on, as I understand it. There is an alternative methodology adopted, I think, in Queensland yeah. um, uh, that adopts a somewhat different scale. But I, as I understand it, um, that... It's not wholeheartedly supported either. So I, I think it'd be fair to say that even the psychiatric uh, uh, medical community uh, do realise that they recognise that there are some weaknesses in the, uh, in the psychiatric impairment rating scale as it's applied in any objective sort of way. Well, at the moment, the question's about the, how do you calculate whole person impairment for the purposes of a lump sum claim of greater concern to the ALA and I suspect to the Law Society and the Bar is the reliance upon that assessment for other purposes and that makes its way in the McDougall Review in Recommendation 37. We say that however you do the assessment, the whole person impairment shouldn't be the basis upon accessing rights for weekly benefits, medical treatment and other things within the scheme. However you get to the, the figure. Yeah, even the, the medical guides themselves say that they were never intended to be any guide to need for medical treatment or uh, access to weekly uh, incapacity payments. Mm. Just in terms of the, I suppose, uh, there's obviously a high, higher level of disputation around psychological claims. Does that tend to be about the acceptance of the claim or is it, is it also reflected in terms of uh, claims for lump sum benefits? Is it like, is that argument around the 15% threshold, is that an area of high disputation or is the, I suppose, the methodology so settled that it's pretty clear <coughs> one way or another whether someone is... It, it is very settled and we would not ask this committee to make any recommendation about changing the, anything. It would be a matter for uh, recommending that the costing be done on making the change. I think as a first step, I don't, don't think we could tell the committee on the basis of our submission that you should act and change, recommend that a change be made to the legislation simply off our submission. There's, there's a lot that's gone into this 
particular review concerning psychological injury and, and uh, you will be hearing and we'll have heard a lot of other evidence that's relevant to, to your consideration. But w as a policy matter, we don't see any reason why people with psychological injuries should be treated differently to people with physical injuries. So, so what, would, what would be the measure that you would recommend in terms of reducing the level of disputation if it's not, if it's not in relation to the lump sum payments or in terms of the acceptance of claim? What's the... I don't think we are saying there's a particular problem with the level of disputation at the legal end of things. I think that the, our approach is that if these things are handled properly and the facts are identified early and the disputes identified early, that of itself would reduce disputes because in the instance of a Section 11A, an employer may be annoyed that someone's gone off on stress leave after a promotion, demotion or disciplinary action. But if the insurer had in place a system where they actually identified the facts and whether or not there was a process that was or wasn't followed, there's every chance that that 11A dispute would not be raised because the employer would not be able to prove it. Now, that would get rid of a dispute. Now, there's nothing better than actually digging around, working out what the facts are at the beginning and identifying what the problem is. Now, that's, you know, that, that is the best way of dealing with disputes. I think well, one... Can of, I, yep. Sorry, Mr. Ken, can just yep. jump in there then. So, Ms. Wells, <coughs> that then basically, if I'm reading what you're saying correctly, ties back into the initial claim form that's not, that's not right. available now then. That's right. Which, which basically is a, a synopsis of the, mm. of the problem. Yes. That's right. Uh, I wanted to just uh, ask one uh, other question and then pass to the other committee members around perhaps uh, if you could elaborate on the issues around secondary injury and secondary psychological injury. So what is the actual status in terms of the capacity to get any kind of compensation for a secondary psychological injury? Well, the risk, sorry, you, you uh, uh, In terms of whole person impairment and a lump sum payout, you don't receive a lump sum payout for a secondary psychological injury. Uh, can it affect the 15%? So, I mean, obviously, if you've got an initial psychological injury and then the management of the claim obviously exacerbates that, can that push you into the 15% threshold? Very, very unlikely. I mean, you'll have a primary psychological injury usually, sorry, a primary physical injury and then a secondary psychological injury that flows from that. The physical assessment would get done on its own criteria, which usually has very little to do with how you're feeling and the impact the claim has had on you. So for example, it might be a range of motion assessment or um, nerve conduction studies leading to physical assessment. But uh, they do, secondary psychological injuries do impact on, you know, return to work and therefore weekly payments. The treatment that you need, you, you might need to see a psychologist or a counsellor or a psychiatrist for longer. It's more cost of the scheme, entrenching you into the workers' comp scheme for longer and has this snowball effect. They get picked up for benefits, though. If you get a psychological injury, as, if you get a psychological injury uh, arising from a physical injury, then you, you still you get access to uh, medical treatment yes. for the psychological injury. Yeah, and, and you still get weekly benefits. There's no preclusion in terms of weekly benefits. The preclusion is in terms of using a secondary psychological injury to pass the threshold for a work injury damages claim. Yeah. A, a worker could theoretically be physically fit to return from their injury, yet still no longer psychologically fit to return from their secondary psychological injury, and they could be physically ready to return to work, but yet not cleared by their doctor. I see. That's in terms of uh, it becoming a, a permanent impairment. It uh, wouldn't happen. This, this you can't that, aggregate the you can't physical yeah. injury. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, just in terms of the WPI that we are talking about before, not to labour the point too much, but... Um, if you were to reduce it from 15% to 10%, for instance, um, would you assume... I know, I think you said that it would be good for the government maybe to do some costings mm. around that. Do you think it would significant, potentially significantly increase the cost to the scheme? Because the scheme at the moment is already... Um, costs are already, you know, um, increasing quite significantly. I can only give you my own anecdotal answer mm. to that. Um, I've done a lot of psychological injury claims over my career and I've seen a lot of whole person impairment assessments. In my experience, they come in at 8% or 15%. I, you rarely see one that's 11%, yeah. so I don't think it's going to be big. And it could, it could possibly be the thing that causes someone to take their small lump sum and either go back to work or stay on their workers' compensation benefits 
rather than go on to try and pursue a common law claim. It, it might have that um, additional benefit, but I, it's really just an educated guess from my point of view to yeah. say anything about that. And would you say that this that at the moment the scheme is um, unnecessarily adversarial? As this is to all, all three of you, unnecessarily adversarial. And what are some potential um, easy ways to to reduce um, some of the you know the combative nature of of the scheme? Well, in the context of psychological injury claims, I think one of the big issues is that if there's any doubt about the psychological injury claim at all, uh, the insurer gets an investigator to uh, engage as an investigator and a lot of the fact finding that the insurer would otherwise make themselves um, comes courtesy of the investigator and that investigator often speaks to fellow workmates um, and uh, finds out whether there's any basis for a defence, let's say, under Section 11A. I think that early involvement in the investigator of the investigator coupled with repeated what's called IME examinations, uh, independent medical examinations commissioned by the insurer, uh, does create at an early point in a lot of claims. And I think the figures I saw uh, in, the, uh, in answer to the questions I think posed by Sarah and or Reich here was that 63% of psychological injury claims have an investigator appointed. Um, so I think if you couple those things together, it does create, particularly in psychological injury claims, a highly adversarial nature. I mean, Section 11A, whilst uh, it's true that the onus is on the employer, um, if you've got a, a work situation where the employer is able to say who, who or can or can't give a statement uh, and the worker who's left that employment has got little or no control unless that worker's left that employment, the reasonableness or otherwise of uh, the dem the action relation to, uh, to promotion, dem demotion or discipline, it's very difficult for the, uh, the worker to get that evidence together uh, and especially when faced with a, an investigator who might have obtained two or three written statements from a fellow worker. So I think that is something that really entrenches uh, uh, the adversarial nature at a pretty early stage in the process. If I can pick up on that, from that, um, yeah, we agree that it's adversarial nature. The workers are constantly feeling like they have to prove themselves, tell this story and over and over again that you know plays in their mind, and then they feel like their their health is binary. You're either better or you're not. You're either depressed or you're fine. You know, they feel like the insurers are going to have some big got you moment where, oh, well, you can't be that bad. We have footage of you celebrating your birthday. Um, you know, these people need to be able to transition back and, and, and get life back to normal. But having that sort of big brother mindset, people are always watching me, I think, further entrenches that for the injured worker as they retreat into their shell. Yeah, I think um, I think the, the difficulty for, for me to understand really is on the one hand, We've heard, um, we've heard from many witnesses and submissions that the scheme is adversarial and combative, and that insurers are often um, willing, too willing to try to reject claims. But on the other hand, we have a drastic increase in psychological claims. So it doesn't really, if you know what I mean. It's like if it's too adversarial, why are the claims costs going up um, so significantly? It doesn't really. Um, I mean, there's probably merit in both, but what's the how how do how do you reconcile those two things almost existing at the same at the same time? Well, if the if the system is too adversarial, um, people aren't going to get better. So you've got more claims, mm. and and the system isn't helping them. So that's going to make the <coughs> claims more expensive. Yeah. And by adversarial, I. I just don't want to be seen as saying that that's on the legal side of things, it's at the insurance company claims officer side of things. Yeah, I think the change of claims officers, which has been commented on by a number of yeah. um, persons giving evidence, uh, at least in their submissions, um, is a really significant factor. I see numerous psychological injury claimants who feel very satisfied for a while with uh, 
uh, you know, with uh, the, their position, but then they get a new claims officer who's a hard, hard nose, and it becomes, mm. you know, it's the worst thing in the world. So I, I think consistency of claims managers uh, would be very, very helpful, and experience of claims managers, because I think management of workers' compensation claims for psychological injuries is the key. Um, Yes, thanks. There's a big difference between cynicism and healthy cynicism. You know, people, if you want to have a negative mindset about people who are making psychological injury claims, you can easily convince yourself that there's really not very much wrong with them. The healthy cynicism is, well, you need to be critical about what you're seeing, but you need to respect their experience and you need to make them feel as though you do believe them. I mean, they, a lot of the problem you see with some people in, I've seen over the years in the system is they have this absolute um, trauma from feeling that no one believes them mm. and it it creates um, behavior which is not conducive to going back to work Can I, ask, I mean obviously <clears throat> a lot of these claims uh, you, you have a situation where a person effectively is never going to return to the workplace so you've got a whole system designed to get them back into a workplace but the reality is because of the nature of the psychological claim, the psychological injury that they've sustained, they're never going to want to go back. They're never, they can't actually return to work. So do we need to look at another way of dealing with this? And I sort of come to the lump sum question because, yes. I mean, obviously they've got to wait two years and then, of course, there's a whole question about permanent impairment and, of course, they're not, they're not necessarily permanently impaired from doing other work and so then the system's trying to... Knock, effectively knock out their claim on the basis that they, they are able to do alternative work and therefore they're not eligible. Like, do we actually need to look at some different system and maybe commutation is a way of dealing with this, but obviously the two-year waiting period, the 15% threshold, like these are all impediments that are, uh, I suppose, present a, a unique set of challenges for psychological injuries that are quite distinct from physical injuries. I know Tim wants to say something about this, but before you look at lump sum culture, I think you need to go back to give the better claims handling process and other things a go before you say, well, there's this other answer. I mean, the, there's so much that needs to be done to improve the engagement from, the, from what people in the system tell us to improve their return to work rate. But surely it's all about their rather return than to work persisting rate. with a with trying to get someone back into a workplace that's never going to happen, mm. right? Like the system's designed to kind of keep forcing them, and that's where the sort of uh, I said the friction point is in the in the process uh, that can obviously obviously yeah. compound the anxiety that's built by the worker. Uh, you know, like that's that that system's clearly a problem, and of course it's obviously then contributing to poor return to work rates when it comes <coughs> to psychological injuries because yep. the workers are, you know, reluctant and resistant uh, to returning to a workplace that they know is fundamentally hazardous to them. And once you've done, once we've done all we can as a scheme and, and there's nowhere else to go, then there should be proper mechanisms to exit the scheme, in my view. Yeah, and I agree. And uh, the 15% threshold for a commutation, um, quite apart from the other <coughs> issues we have with the current restrictions on commutations, just don't work. Um, arguably, the ones that the scheme should be um, removing uh, are those with smaller uh, liabilities potentially available. So that just doesn't allow the opportunity for that to happen. And one also must also take into account um, the, the positive psychological benefit I think you often see with people who know that they're not going to be able to return to work in, within your example. Uh, and see that they're no longer going to be beholden to the insurance company to provide certificates of capacity every month as they're required to do. Uh, they they regain some independence um, that that they haven't had since their injury, and the, the the positive psychological and even physical benefit of that should not be underestimated. But at the moment, effectively, if you don't reach that fifteen percent threshold, there's no mechanisms to exit the scheme. Um, until your benefits run out, or if you do reach that threshold, you make an allegation of negligence and you, you bring a common law claim. But other than that, you're within the system for as long as that ride takes you. So that's what, five years, really, isn't it? So yeah. Uh, and then potentially five more years for treatment after that. So um, 
you effectively, you know, you've got someone on on weekly benefits for all that period of time when that, and that's obviously going to affect the return to work rate. Uh, and you know, of course, surely there must be a better mechanism. What's the in, what's the I suppose what's the threshold that we need to look at? know about threshold, but I don't know why the workers' compensation system is always so reluctant to retrain people or pay for them to do a course. I mean, to recognise that there are those cases where this person can't go back into this job. Well, what can we do to assist you to move yourself off into something that's going to give you some satisfaction? I mean, maybe that's something that could be considered. I think the, on the only threshold I'd suggest is that it be in the best interests of the worker. Um, that used to be the situation, as it was for what what are called what were called redemptions under the pre in the 1926 Act. They, it was a matter of whether it's in their best interest, as assessed by the what was then the uh, uh, Compensation Court, now the Person Injury Commission, um, as well as obtaining legal advice. Uh, they're, they're the only two preconditions uh, that the Law Society would say are appropriate. So you'd say no waiting period for that. Well, there haven't, there wasn't traditionally under the old legislation. I don't see any rational, rational reason why there should be. But um, yeah, you, you, sorry, you, you referenced two years earlier. That that's not a waiting period to get a whole person impairment claim within the legislation. I think I'm not sure where that fit, that two years came from, but I suspect that's how long someone's takes to get to maximum medical improvement before they can do their assessment, before they can then access those benefits. But there's no, no statutory. Requirement. So if you're talking about a statutory period in order to get assessment for a person impairment, if that's what you were referring to before. And that when, when we did have commutations and before that redemptions, quite often the reason why the person would want to take the lump sum is to retrain themselves. Mm. You know, so that is something that accommodates that retraining option, gives someone some time to, you know, they've got a bit of money, it's in the bank, they can do some training, they can work themselves into a slightly different career path. So that should be available. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how yeah. early it could be. Not too early, I wouldn't imagine. Actually, t talking about careers, oh, okay. yeah. is, is there a certain profession that has higher uh, claims in, oh, in terms of that? psychological... I know the legal profession's got a pretty high rate, but <laughs> some I can't speak about anyone else. You try politics. <laughs> no, some, no, well, I, I think but my but experience that those with right. office-type jobs... Um, uh, tend to be the most regular uh, peers before me as a, as a climate solicitor um, because of the potential for bullying within that environment, I think perhaps is somewhat more or a public service type job. Um, yeah, but that's just anecdotal. Yeah. Uh, I know that there are a lot of figures uh, that you've seen before you from both Sarah and I care on that sort of, on that type of frequency within professions. Certainly emergency service workers um, have a high propensity to suffer psychological injuries, police force in particular. Uh, you yeah. do see in the education space as well. Yeah. Those yeah. employees often are lodging claims. Yeah. But uh, you'd, you'd imagine they're different types of claims. And I think there were some answers to questions by CIRA and ICARE that sort of try and break those cohorts of numbers down into those categories. Yeah, no, the reason I asked the question was just so if we, we can identify those particular areas or careers where there's more, uh, more, more problems, then perhaps we can find ways of how to address those, those issues to stop it coming forward. And last question from myself, and I believe it was your, your submission, Mr. Butcher. You mentioned about um, the fees. You want to increase the fees. In the opening remarks, I think that was... Yes, that might yeah. have been In, me, actually. Might, yeah. might have been yourself. Remarks, yeah. Yeah. Is, so... You know, and I understand cost everything goes goes up, and I understand I ran a business for many, many years myself. But at the moment, is that having an impact on, on people putting their claims through? I don't think so. You've got to understand the legal cost that we're talking about, Schedule 6, which is largely not used by claimant solicitors at the moment. Uh, what that's relevant to is those acting for uh, claimants within the... Uh, exempted workers' space, so police and ambulance officers and whatnot, uh, and those acting for insurers. Uh, for, for most workers who are represented by claimants, we're governed by the IRO, the, 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 the uh, scheme that 
that IRO um, um, has uh, called the ILAR scheme. Yeah, ILAR, uh, that's right. So that's different to Schedule 6, and they yeah. operate completely separately. Well, they, they may be informed by Schedule 6, but uh, it's not really a determinant of how much we get paid as a claimant solicitor. Okay, right. I was just trying to get a better understanding of, of yep. why last that's all and how yep. that works. Yep, yep, yep. Right. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, just one from me. In our, in our last hearing, we had some submissions that um, when it came to psychological injuries, that the, work play, the, the Works Compensation Scheme wasn't necessarily fit for purpose and that there were certain things, and I think it's been touched upon by Mr Adam as well, in terms of where you get to 15 person whole body impairment and how that works. And of course, you've outlined how it works when it comes to psychological injuries. But do you see any benefit in having a separate scheme when it comes to assessing psychological injuries in the workplace? No. No? <laughs> I think the Law Society would have to take that question on notice, I must say. Uh, it's not something that I've ever considered, or, or nor has the Society, so we'd, I'd be pleased to have that opportunity. I should say the same thing. That was really my personal thought. <laughs> <laughs> that was straight to the sure, point. We'll all, we all take it on notice. <laughs> <laughs> Often the first response is the best. <laughs> Any further questions? Yes. Uh, <coughs> yep. Sorry to return to this issue, but... Um, with respect to the matter uh, of the claims managers and claims management in general, um, uh, take the point that was made <coughs> about uh, hearing from previous witnesses, both in submissions and oral evidence, about frustration associated with the way in which their claim is, is managed, um, uh, being uh, asked to repeat experience and repeat the experience. Um, the person who is managing the file leaves, the new person comes in, the temperament and disposition of that person coming in may be different from the one who's left. Um, matters of, um, dare I say, young people uh, with perhaps not a, a whole lot of life experience, uh, not having certain sensitivity about managing and talking about issues, etc., etc., etc. But I also um, get a sense also from the evidence uh, from individuals that the actual <coughs> information that's being looked at by the claims manager, the detail of the person's um, claim, um, is, is often very general in its nature. Um, and perhaps it's going back to the point that we're raising earlier that, and this is where I'm trying to work out the pieces, and I, th I think... Um, Ms. Welsh, you, 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 you raised an interesting point that the way it was once done, and that is a paper file, not that we're ever going to go back to that, did have some advantage to it in terms of content and detail and what have you. And I'm just, and, it, and we've got the regulator in this afternoon, um, and, uh, and I get that, that the actual, whilst these magnificent, you know, pieces of electronic hardware in place and can do all sorts of things, that that there doesn't seem to be that sort of content established and then content flow with any continuity. Um, now, th that may be very simplistic on my part, but I just get the sense that there is a, an issue there, which means that as we progress through it, there is this sort of circling back and maybe back again, and then that creates frustration, obviously, for the injured worker, but, but just a frustration for the system itself. So I'm just wondering, perhaps, um, any comments about that? Uh, yeah, all, that all that is correct. Um, our experience is that whether it's by design or, or by chance, there's, there's no handover <coughs> between case officers. There's no doubt going to be turnover of employment. We can't prevent that. No. Uh, history shows, I think, that there's been a high rate of turnover in at least in EML um, some time ago. So there's going to be some change in personnel who's looking at the file. How you do that needs to be properly managed. We saw ICARE's recent announcement that they're going to be expanding the number of insurers. I don't know where they're going to get the staff from. So they're going to be some new staff coming in, running new claims. We don't know what kind of level of experience they're going to get. The market for quality case officers would have consolidated with EML in recent years. And now all of a sudden, are those people going to find new homes? Or are we going to train people up from the, from the start? But there's going to be ongoing problems in the next few years, I would imagine, in how we're going to manage these claims. And then how do we build on from that? Um, it's going to be an issue. 
I guess it was, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I'm right. looking at that, and it doesn't seem to be too many roses in the garden looking forward. Correct. It just well, seems look, to we be... don't work on that side of the fence, but I don't know whether they have a summary that they, they read, where they do a proper handover. I'd imagine some people no, leave I'm... employment yeah. without giving a handover to their replacement um, for, for whatever reason that may be. So there's going to be some challenges, but the insurers need to find ways to deal with those. I, I think the, uh, the announcement that I saw the other day also suggested that there will be specialist workers' compensation, specialist psychiatric injury claims consultants. Mm. Um, I, I'd be suggesting that perhaps that wouldn't be the most sought-after job within the uh, insurance industry, uh, solely dealing with psychiatric injury claims. So that would be a real concern I would have, or I, I mean, ideally that should be the case, that you're dealing with experienced claims officers, but I'm not sure that mm. having those uh, uh, claims managers dealing solely with psychiatric injury claims is a great idea. Yeah. Um, and Deputy Chair, can I just say this? The, the struggle that the claims officers have is the same struggle that we all have with going back to a point in time and working out what happened, and we all have to have a system for managing it. Yeah. And there's no reason why there can't be some resource on file that contains all of those early documents um, so that it's easy, they can be readily found, that everyone knows what they are and you have to read all of that before you're allowed to ring the client up. You can't just ring the client up and say, oh, hi, I'm your new claims manager, tell me what happened to you. Isn't it the case that in a lot of psych injuries, the claim comes much later after the injury? You know, like, so the worker will be injured, they'll go off on sick leave, uh, and then the actual uh, workers' complaint will be uh, put in at a later stage once they've obtained some advice or... I've seen them on the day. No, I don't think you can really generalise about that. Sometimes people keep working until one day they can't take it anymore and then they're gone and they hand in a medical certificate and they never come back. Um, uh, yeah, I think it depends on the genesis of the psychological injury in the first place. If, it, if it's a tragic accident, let's say, or a very specific event... Uh, that's incredibly traumatic. Uh, I think you're likely to have a psychological injury pretty much straight away. If it's a gradual bullying type harassment claim, then it's going to be somewhat slower and probably more delayed, mm. I suspect. But Sorry, Greg. No, 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 that's fine. No, 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 that's fine. Thank Any you. further questions from committee members? I might just ask you if, while well, I've got you there, uh, I think it's the ALA submission talks about 60 AA. Perhaps you could elaborate on this issue around the restriction on injured workers accessing domestic assistance. Yeah, so it's um, the submission in relation to 60 capital, um, A capital A um, deals with the fact that you have to have been receiving the treatment and care at the time of the injury. Um, so I think if I had... I'll just grab my submission if you need a moment. I believe in the submission we gave a few examples of where this causes some trouble, so I'll try and stick to the same examples. Um, the examples we gave was a young person living at home with his parents who had a serious injury would be forever precluded from receiving domestic assistance because they weren't um, doing those domestic chores at the time of the injury. Uh, and the second example was a female worker. So it seems to me you know, inherently unfair that someone who might be in need of that assistance can't obtain it because of the life circumstances they were in at the time of their injury forever being precluded. Um, the legislation currently has no way for which us as practitioners can help them recover that treatment and care that they or need. Is it something that has a specific intent behind it? I think it was probably copied from the motor accident legislation and the prohibition there uh, on uh, on care that that wasn't being provided immediately prior to the to the work accident um, for whatever reason, and that was probably from the 1999 legislation, motor accident legislation. I, I think that might have come from there, but uh, um, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't help at the moment off the top of my head where it came from. But, um, you know, it doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, it's a grave injustice, I think, to those mm. people. So rectifying that, I Why can't imagine, would have an enormous cost. cost to the scheme, but would, you know, right a wrong for a few people who are in desperate need for help. Okay, 
Could I just say one thing? I feel I just think I should say something um, to correct what I said about claims officers. I'm not suggesting that the claims officers have an easy job. It's no. very difficult no. dealing with those people on the phone. And I understand that when you meet a new person, it's ordinary to ask them something about themselves. And if you want to understand what's happened to someone, the best way of doing it is to ask them. And, and I myself, by reading documents, don't get nearly as much out of them as I do by having a conversation with someone for five minutes. So, yeah. you know, I, I acknowledge all of that. And so the answer there is consistency of claims officers. Yeah. And that's a massive challenge, it seems. No, thank you. No, no, thank you. That's um, a good point. All right. Well, thank you. Unless there's any further questions, thank you so much for um, coming today and for presenting us with, with your evidence. Um, committee members may have additional questions for you after the hearing. The committee has resolved that the answers to these, along with any answers to questions taken on notice today, be returned within 14 days. The Secretariat will contact you in relation to these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We'll now break for lunch and we'll be back at one o'clock.
Um, but thank you so much for uh, coming today, and I'd like to welcome our next witnesses. Uh, could each witness, starting from my left, please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation? Matthew Press, Executive Director for Compliance and Dispute Resolution Safe Work. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Jim Kelly, Director of Health and Safe Design at Safe Work New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Would either of you like to start with a short opening statement? If we could, thank you, Chair. Thanks. So thank you very much for the opportunity to appear um, amongst you all today. Look, in Australia and across the world, um, I think there's been increasing acknowledgement that mental health is a key component of overall health and wellbeing. At the first hearing, this inquiry heard from many different stakeholders who described mental health as a global and very complex issue. And it's so complex because it spreads across both personal lives, work lives, across both social and workplace settings, and from, I guess, a public policy perspective is both a workplace safety issue and a public health issue. In New South Wales, um, workers have the right to work safely without harm arising from physical or psychosocial risk, and businesses have a responsibility to take all reasonable practical steps to manage both physical and psychological hazards at work. Now, although there remains plenty to do, Safe Work has undertaken significant work to try and create mentally healthy workplaces in our state. And while there's very much opportunity for improvement ahead, I think arguably New South Wales is a national leader in this space. A centrepiece of Safe Work's approach has been the implementation of the Mentally Healthy Workplaces Strategy, which was launched in 2016, with the headline objective of ensuring by the 30th of June this year that we had 90,000 New South Wales businesses taking effective action to create mentally healthy workplaces. The strategy was retuned and refreshed in May last year, um, considering the, the different ways of working that we experienced through COVID. And four focus areas were introduced direct practical coaching, tailored support for regional and small businesses, and focused collaboration with high-risk um, industry sectors. Safe Work has just started to evaluate the effectiveness of this strategy as part of building the next iteration for 2023 and beyond. And while we're very cautious to rely too heavily on preliminary results, the first round of survey analysis shows that things might be just pointing in the right direction. We seem to have achieved at least 92,000 businesses taking effective action, exceeding our target, and representing a 37.5% increase on the baseline results from 2017. We've also observed similarly positive signs from the workplace training programs, with 91% of businesses reporting that they have invested in changes after completing the direct practical coaching, and 78% making changes after completing the training. Supporting this strategy is that been the implementation of the recent regulatory changes which have been discussed earlier this morning and they've significantly enhanced both the laws that we have um, to regulate and the businesses have to operate in. In May we became, the uh, last year sorry, we became the first jurisdiction to introduce an industry-wide code of practice which formally clarified the legal responsibilities businesses have in addressing psychosocial hazards at work. Having this code in place has been transformative for us um, because it's helpfully explained what compliance looks like, making it easier for us as the regulator to enforce, but also just as importantly for businesses um, to understand and implement. And we believe that by having this detail in place um, will significantly help us advance the understanding and management of psychological hazards. The second major regulatory change occurred via amendments to the Work Health and Safety Regulations and last month, New South Wales became the first jurisdiction to adopt the model provisions on psychosocial risks that were published by Safe Work Australia in June of this year. The amendments insert new requirements for businesses to manage psychosocial risks in the workplace, defining psychosocial hazard and psychosocial risk, and clarifying the appropriate control measures that businesses are required to implement to manage those risks. Those new pr provisions in the regulations complement the code and going forward will also support SafeWorks' focus on harmful workplace behaviours 
to the new Respect at Work Task Force, which was announced by the government in June. In our view, the last three years have seen significant investment in education, training and new regulation. And coupled together, these changes now provide ourselves as the regulator and businesses with a much stronger platform to achieve resilient changes in workplace behaviour. Mental health, we must acknowledge, is a multi-dimensional harm and we don't have all of the answers. As the regulator, we know that mental health in the workplace absolutely matters, that it can have serious impacts on the health, well-being, and productivity of workers and society in general. But we're also conscious of the need to continually invest in research so that we can better understand the drivers and the relationships, and just as importantly, what are going to be the most re uh, effective regulatory controls in response. Mental health is a harm that we can't resolve unilaterally. It requires ongoing focus across government, our colleagues in CIRA, ICARE and New South Wales Health, to mention a few, as well as the support of employees, their employers and society more broadly. Regardless of these challenges, for us, the mission is very clear. We want all workplaces across New South Wales to be treating mental health as a priority, with the same focus and attention as physical harms, and just as importantly, to have it embedded in business cultures and processes through the actions of both business leaders and their workers. We know there's opportunity for further improvement, but from where we are today, we're confident that what's been implemented over the last three years is pushing in the right direction and will enhance the way that New South Wales businesses support mental health going forward. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, just a question for me to kick off. Um, you mentioned about research to better understand the drivers behind um, mental health issues uh, in our workplaces. Any initial obs observations you might have about um, what is driving the increase in psychological uh, claims at the moment. We've seen quite a strong increase over the last few years. Um, yeah, any any insights about what you think might be um, might be the causes behind driving those those uh, claims? Thank you, sir. I think it was touched on in one of the earlier um, um, submissions earlier today. Uh, we, we're seeing a society change, so I think um, certainly more awareness in society of mental health issues uh, collectively is certainly a, a driving factor. Uh, we also um, are well aware over the last five years or so that our mental health strategy has been around that we've increased awareness of um, the obligations of employers and also of the, the rights of, of workers um, to raise mental health concerns in the workplace. And we see those as, as significant driving factors for why people are lodging um, workers' compensation claims in relation to mental health, um, but also seeking support and assistance. And, and we actively encourage people to seek support and assistance as early as possible because I think early intervention is a really key um, step in, in terms of managing these issues. Um, we want to empower employers with the opportunity to um, address the harm, and they can't do that if they're not aware of the harm. So um, raising awareness and, and the general society uh, are big drivers. The other more recent um, driver <coughs> is obviously the impact of the pandemic and, and, mm. and the economic challenges that businesses have faced and workers have faced throughout the last three years. We know we've seen extraordinary uh, challenges when it comes to natural disasters. Um, and also economic challenges for both businesses and workers throughout the last three or four years. Um, and that's certainly impacted on mental health generally in the community, but also in the workplace. Yeah, it's a good point about um, the people um, coming forward early to seek assistance. I suppose whilst we are very worried about the exponentially um, increasing psychological claims, um, the flip side would be you also don't want people not feeling comfortable coming forward and um, and not putting in a claim or not getting the assistance that they that they need um, as well, which might keep claims costs low, but um, but it's obviously a terrible situation to be in if people aren't coming forward to get the assistance they they need. So. And I think traditionally we have seen an, an underreporting of psychological mm. um, harms in the workplace, um, yeah. and that's certainly been a challenge for both workplaces and us as a regulator. Yeah. Any questions from committee members? Yes. Mr Donnelly? <coughs> Thank you, Chair and through you, Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming along this afternoon. Uh, and appreciate the submission in the first instance to the inquiry, which provides some uh, valuable background information. Uh, with respect to that submission, um, which I'm sure you, you better put your hand on, um, on the bottom of what's page number one, 
but not the cover sheet, page number one. Um, going on to the next page is some commentary about the, uh, the Safe Work New South Wales inspectors and the importance of, of inspectors in terms of the work that Safe Work does. Um, now, it is the case that uh, with respect to the inspectorate, um, and is it just a single inspectorate, a, a group of individuals who are the inspectors, or is it sort of a, a unit per se, or is it split into different... Uh, so, so in regards to psychosocial health particularly, or no, just total, general? just total. Just give us the picture. Uh, uh, is the inspectorate a, a single group of individuals that make up the inspectorate? No. So we have we have a number of directorates. Um, so we have two directorates that focus on construction industry primarily. So construction yep. metro, and a construction regional. Yep. Uh, we also similarly have another two directorates which focus on uh, work health safety. I guess apart from construction in a metro. And regional setting. Yeah. Then we have the chemicals and explosives, um, and specialist services directorate, and then we have um, the Jim's health and, and safety design directorate. Okay. Uh, sorry, what was that last one? Health and safety design. So that's health. An that's an inspectorate, is it? Your, uh, Mr. Uh, Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, so I have a team of about 70 staff um, and roughly two-thirds of those are inspectors um, right. across so, a number of specialist so, areas. So with respect to the health and safety design uh, part of the organisation, um, uh, is it within that group that the psychological um, uh, or the specialist psychological inspectors are embedded? Yes. 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 So what's the total number uh, of of full-time equivalents or headcount in the HSD. Did you say there were 70? So health and safety design includes a number of specialists, not just mental health. Just to, just to clarify, we have um, ergonomic specialists, we have yeah, working environment specialists. Did you say the total was 70? So 70 in total, not all the specialists? No, 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 70. No, I'm just trying to get the, the numbers right here. So with respect to within that 70, so the, the subset uh, within that number of 70 of specialist psychological inspectors, how many of those would there be? So I have two teams of, um, that focus on mental health in particular. Uh, one team is, is psychological health inspectors uh, and provide specialist advice to our generalist inspectors, of, of which there are about 342 across the business and all respond to psychological incidents. Yeah. Of the specialist team, we have um, a, a full complement is eight inspectors um, plus a manager. So uh, there is effectively eight uh, individuals who are if I could describe it this way, specifically devoted to specialist psycho psychological inspectorate work. That's correct. And they're supported by a team of project staff of about 15. Did you say they didn't do direct inspections themselves? They provided support to other inspectors? No, that was no the they do both. Um, so we have a, essentially a, a tiered scale. So um, if you consider psychological claims in, in a sort of a three tiers of, of complexity, mm. tier one um, com complaints would go to all inspectors, so any of the 300 in our um, generalist teams that are based on geography, metropolitan and regional New South Wales, um, might respond to a, what would be considered a, a tier one type um, complaint or, or request for service. Tier two, uh, generally speaking, our specialist services would provide coaching sort of support and mentoring to those generalist inspectors. And tier three might be the more complex and, and severe matters um, such as a suicide or or a, um, a complex multifaceted complaint um, where our specialist inspectors would take the lead. So, I appreciate that. So, <clears throat> what I'm just trying to get is some specificity around those individuals who um, have full-time responsibility. And I understand they're named or called specialist uh, psychological inspectors. Is that a term that you use or it's not a um, term that you They use? all have the same role description, um, but we have a specialised team. So, we recruit um, both externally and internally to the yeah. specialised team. So, but, but that group... Uh, within the 70 that does specialist work in the area of, of psychological injury, there's a total of eight of those. Is that a correct state? Inspectors. Inspectors, yeah. Now, with respect to that total of eight, um, is there a division between uh, metropolitan and regional in terms of their location? So they're metropolitan based, but they provide statewide support. So the eight uh, are for the state of New South Wales. Um, on notice, uh, would you be able to provide, so obviously not now, but on notice, could you provide us with the number of these dedicated uh, specialist psychological inspectors uh, for the financial years 
18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 21. Certainly can take that And on. 22, we've got the figure of eight, as I understand it. That's, yeah. Um, now... Uh, just to note, it does fluctuate based on vacancies and... Oh, no, I appreciate that, um, which, is, which is my next question, actually. So these are eight uh, uh, full-time uh, equivalent uh, people doing this work of uh, specialist psychological inspecting. Um, with respect to those, are those uh, eight positions currently uh, filled uh, by individuals? There's no vacancies? We currently have uh, two vacancies in addition to the eight substantive positions. Um, so there's we... actually six on the ground, if we could put it that way? Uh, no, sorry, just to Ten. clarify, we have um, eight substantive positions that are occupied. We have two additional positions that were recently approved but not filled. Oh, okay, sorry. Because we've had trouble attracting talent um, at that assistant okay. state inspector level. So uh, we weren't able to get the talent we wanted at the last recruitment and we intend to go out in the very near future. So fingers crossed, all things considered, that the eight will hopefully go through to up to ten in the not too distant future. That's the goal, absolutely. If it all goes to plan. And can I just clarify, of those eight, we currently have a couple that are on tem temporary um, movements across the business. Um, so not all What eight. does that mean? Uh, so uh, they may be, um, as, as part of our risk management, to ensure that um, to manage things like psychological burnout, um, the nature of the, the work we do is, is quite strenuous, as you'd imagine, yeah. dealing with this sure. complex work. We do rotate staff in and out of the business from time to time. Yeah. Um, it's a part of our proactive management to support our workforce. So in effect, the two coming on and replacing the two that are out, which gets us back to eight. Wherever possible, but there, there are some um, temporary vacancies at present. Yeah, so we're effectively uh, sitting at eight. Um, now, with respect um, <coughs> to the work done um, by these individuals, uh, what division um, of better regulation um, or the team uh, do they actually work in? So can you, with some precision, tell us exactly where they work? Perhaps it has been answered by the first uh, response which broke them down into those different uh, areas. So, they sit, so all, of the, all of those specialist staff sit within <coughs> Mr Kelly's team within the Health and Safety Design Directorate. Okay. Just a couple more before I pass it through the chair, back to the chair or to my colleague. Um, uh, with respect to uh, the turnover um, of inspectors, um, in other words, uh, people um, who, who have left the role, um, uh, in other words, not, have not been uh, repositioned elsewhere within the organisations but have actually uh, resigned. Has there been any resignations over the last 12 months? From the psychological health mm. um, inspectorate? I'm aware of one resignation uh, that happened for a fairly new recruit within, I think it was six months of her appointment. Okay, oh, sorry, so th th there's, uh, been, there's been one resignation, yeah. Uh, uh, may I correct that? There's, there's been two. One long-term employee who has moved on and one short-term employee, um, less than six months. Okay, and uh, what was the reason for the long-term employee part moving on? Uh, I think she was ready for a change. Um, she'd been with us for an um, extensive period of time, both in the psych psychological um, specialist team and, and other generalist inspector roles, um, mm. and has moved on to another appointment. Okay. Um, yeah, um, you Mr that? Roberts, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Press and Mr. Kelly. I'll address this to you, Mr. Press, as the Executive Director. Has Safe Work undertaken any enforcement action at all against any PCBUs in relation to not providing a safe workplace as far as mental health <coughs> issues are concerned? Um, Mr. Kelly, we could we'll talk to specifics who manages that area more closely than me. Fine, I don't care who answers it, doesn't matter. As long as I get an answer. <laughs> yes, thank you for the question. Um, we certainly have. So most recently, um, a fairly significant outcome for us was an um, enforcement undertaking that we entered into from following a violence matter within Sydney LHD. Um, that enforcement undertaking was the, the greatest um, undertaking we've, we've entered into for any, both physical and psychological um, matters, uh, with in excess of $3 million, uh, which uh, essentially will drive significant improvements in terms of violence in the healthcare sector, particularly around hospitals. Uh, for that particular matter, and that had both physical and psychological implications for the workers involved. Um, in addition to that, we, we do take a number of um, enforcement actions, primarily through improvement notices. For our, for our, um, through what, sorry? Improvement notices. Uh, notice. Yeah. Um, across, um, across our request for service uh, matters and our instance that do come to us. Perhaps then on notice you might be able to take this and then come back with some more specific details in relation to that. How many how many enforcement actions you've taken, what they were, whether they were improvement notices or, or escalated, mm -hmm. and um, and the results of those. Yes, I can, can take drill down on this a bit. Yep, certainly. 
that yeah, question to Mr. I, Dale. I wanted to ask about, uh, so there's been some recent uh, media attention around a suicide at uh, Ernest & Young. Uh, and uh, I wanted to know whether um, whether safe work had been involved, or perhaps in a more general sense, uh, whether there are suicides uh, that may have a nexus with the workplace. What does safe work do? How, how do you engage with that situation? Obviously, there's there's a potential there. This is a work related death, uh, and therefore requires a response from the regulator. How does safe work deal with that? Yeah, so that's that Mr. Adam is, is in that tier three category um, because of the complexity and just I think like you're alluding to, we've got to really understand the nexus between the controls and the and the role of the workplace um, and, and the role of other factors and I guess that's um, that's a challenging process for us as, as a regulator and, and investigator to unpack that. Um, but that's that's essentially our approach to unravel and see what might have been a driver on the on the workplace side and see what are, what other things might have been possible um, to help prevent. I, I can add to that and I, and I should acknowledge that, that matter remains under investigation so I won't refer to that matter. That so safe raised. work are investigating and I can confirm in that. that, yes. Right, okay. Right. Um, but in relation to um, suicide matters in general and, and, and tragically we do have um, nine people per day on average die by suicide in Australia, um, seven days male and two female. Uh, we take that extremely seriously. Um, as we all know, suicide is a very multifaceted, um, complex issue. Mm. Um, it does not always arise out of the workplace or, or private life and, and normally has a contributing factor for both in many cases. Um, when a matter is referred to um, the regulator, um, as in Safe Work New South Wales, um, suggesting that work is a contributing factor, we do take a look at those matters. Uh, it, it, How does the, it get referred? Like, does it, does um, so the police suggest that there might be a workplace nexus or how, does, how do you actually get uh, notified that this particular suicide may have a work-based nexus? Yes, it's a, it's a good question, and it can come from any source, whether it be family members um, who, who, who believe or suggest that um, the fact that a work may be a contributing factor, work colleagues, um, or even the workplace itself. Um, perhaps if, if the cause of death um, occurs at the workplace, then that's often, often a referral. Uh, otherwise, it's emergency services or others who may find evidence on, on the scene that may suggest um, work is a contributing factor, such as a note, for example. Um, what about where there's a, a, a workers' compensation uh, claim, perhaps liability has been uh, uh, accepted that it's a psychological injury and then the worker suicides? Is there, do, does safe work have a role in that circumstance? Well, where, again, we rely heavily on referrals um, to, to draw that connection. Do you have um, any independent systems to be able to determine whether there's, there's a role there for safe work? I mean, you know, we can see uh, in the statistics, uh, you know, that there are, particularly in the public service, where there's high levels of psychological injuries. Uh, clearly, something's happening. There's a lot of injuries occurring that are of a psychological nature. What systems do you have in place to, I suppose, draw your regulatory attention to those workplaces where it's clear that there's, you know, significant injuries occurring. Uh, and I, I would cite, for example, the education sector, which mm. I think has a very high number of psychological injuries. It's a major workplace, uh, work, uh, major employer in the public sector. Um, what regulatory attention have you provided to uh, the Department of Education, for example, to satisfy yourself as a regulator? that they've got safe systems of work in place that are protecting people from psychological injuries? And so that's, I think that's a broader question than, than just suicides, but if we talk about um, government agencies, which we know are overrepresented when we look at CMF data and claims data amongst the government agencies, we have a portfolio arrangement where um, a, 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 ma a manager within our organisation, uh, not necessarily a psychological health team, but all, all teams would have a management portfolio um, that works very closely with the, with the government department. So there is a manager that's responsible for the Department of Education um, uh, they would meet on a regular basis, normally three or four monthly, to proactively manage um, claims by physical and psychological in those depart government departments uh, and look at trend management, uh, look at complaints and incidents that are coming through to us and proactively have discussions around what are those government departments doing to manage those risks. Have you issued any uh, uh, you know, uh, improvement notices or uh, what, what kind of regulatory action are you taking in education, for example, where there's clearly 
an issue in terms of psychological hazards. I need to take that on notice. I'm not the, the portfolio holder for the Department of Education. Uh, however, um, I could, I'm happy to take that on notice. Can I ask about, uh, I mean, obviously you're, you're the, you, you have regulatory authority uh, in relation to work health and safety and protecting workers from psychological hazards. Uh, what about, you have to have an exemplary record as an organisation yourself. Is there, are there issues in terms of uh, uh, psychological risks, psychological hazards in safe work that we should be concerned about? As I touched on before, we, we take our, our health and safety of our workers very seriously. Uh, we are certainly by no means perfect, and we don't claim to be. Um, managing mental health is a really challenging um, task for any organisation. Um, as I mentioned in my own psychological health team, we, we have that proactive role of rotating staff in and out um, as a way of managing the, the risk to them because it is quite a challenging role, as you'd imagine. Um, and uh, there's other hot spots across, the, across our agency and also the, the Department of Customer Service, more broadly speaking. Uh, we work very closely with our people and culture team for the Department of Customer Service to ensure that they are proactively driving um, both physical and psychological um, prevention um, and adopting what we essentially preach um, as a regulator to other organisations and agencies. And I believe Department of Customer Service is performing quite um, competitively when you compare it to other departments. Mm. I think another thing we're doing, Mr. Dan, is trying to keep an eye on the data and so the incidents. So um, in about the last six months, we noticed uh, an uptick in, in threats of self-harm um, that, that our frontline staff were experiencing when they're engaging um, with the public. So we introduced quite quickly um, some guidance tool that's available on every desktop to try and help lead staff through those interactions. Um, so, yeah, as best as we can, we're trying to be aware of what's out there, listen to our staff, consult with them on how, how to manage um, yeah, as much as possible. So one of the key sort of data sources, isn't it, it would be the People Matter survey where they ask questions that give you a bit of an indication about the psychosocial environment in a workplace. Are you scrutinising that data to see whether there's specific areas within your organisation that have uh, perhaps uh, red flags or... Uh, where there should be some further attention directed? As a regulator, we, we deliberately keep um, a distance from our own organisation. Uh, if, if matters arise where there is a potential conflict, then we would refer that to Department of Primary Industries. Um, however, we do expect all departments, including our own, um, to regularly review the People Matters um, employer survey results as just one of many indicators they may rely upon to inform um, themselves of, of issues arising, particularly in relation to psychological health. So that matter um, would be an obligation of our, um, our chief people officer. Essentially. During estimates, I asked, uh, I think either yourself, Mr. Press, or perhaps it was Ms. Hogan, about providing specific people matter data uh, in relation to safe work. Uh, the department failed to provide that data. Do you have any explanation as to why that specific data can't be provided? I'm not aware, sorry, no. Are you able to, on notice, provide the people matters data for? <laughs> The director, directorate that you oversee. You want to take a question on notice about a question on notice. All right. Well, I'll, I, if you'd like to take on notice, my question is: Can you provide the committee with the data? Can, uh, can I just for seek your directorate? clarification, or, if possible, or, or will you provide? The data? <laughs> <laughs> can I just seek clarification, if possible? Safe Work as an agency um, doesn't exist anymore. The brand certainly does, but the agency belongs part of the Better Regulation Division. Mm -hmm. So we can certainly provide People Matters results for the Better Regulation Division and or the, um, or the CDR, the Compliance and Dispute Resolution stream that Mr Press um, manages. Um, but Safe Work itself is, is part of the Better Regulation Division, so just to, to clarify the question. Well, for uh, Mr Press's uh, specific... Stream of Better Regulation stream Division? of Better Regulation, if we could have the People Matters... And this year's results are not quite an available yet. Chart uh, help us understand it. Yeah, well, that, my colleague makes a very good point. Could you provide an organisational chart to help us have a better understanding of the Just so it all fits together nicely. Yes. Yeah. And this year's results are, are yet to be made available. I think they're about a month away from memory. Can I ask also about, uh, in, in your opening statement, you, uh, you referred to the uh, uh, healthy workplaces. What's the name of the policy? Let me just find it. Strategy. The strategy, yes. The uh, New South Wales Mentally Healthy Workplaces Strategy. And you used some specific wording. You talked about businesses taking effective action. What constitutes effective action? I can take that question, if I may. 
Uh, so back in 2018, um, we worked together with, with some of the, the best academics in the, in the country to identify a 42 question um, standard, I suppose, of what we expect um, employers to um, establish in order to be a mentally healthy workplace. Uh, we graded that on a, on a five tier scale, um, starting from basic awareness, uh, where they have next to nothing in place, intention, where they have the right intention to create a mentally healthy workplace, but not much more. Uh, where they have um, limited action, so they might have an employee assistance program. Um, they may react in a responsive way to issues when they arise, but they're not doing much in terms of prevention. To effective action, um, and we defined effective action as businesses that are proactively manage managing mentally healthy workplace. They have prevention strategies. Isn't it isn't effective action that there's no injuries or that there's reduced injuries? Like, isn't that a better measure in terms of the efficacy of the strategy that you actually see a decline? in psychological injuries? Well, the issue with that is that's, Why a lag, that part of the goal? that's a lag indicator. So that happens after the event. These measures are measures that you can do prior to um, exposure or issues occurring. So these are measures that measure proactive action um, that we would want to see employers take in order to prevent... Um, Surely the purpose the of the strategy is to prevent injury. And so this, the effectiveness of the strategy is to <coughs> determine whether it did prevent injuries... So why are you assessing it on the basis of taking preventative actions rather than the actual goal of the strategy, well, the goal that should, the, the goal that the strategy should have, which is reducing injury levels? Why isn't that the measure that you're using to determine whether the action is effective? The measure that was determined was um, these 42 question um, criteria that establishes what effective action is. Um, that is proactive action that we want businesses to take. So our measure of success in, in engagement with the best academics in the country was to proactively drive businesses to take action, which we know from the evidence um, that over time we will see results from that. But if, if there's no change in the number of psychological injuries, then even if they are taking the product, then the strategy is not working, well, surely? Well, I, well, I guess, Mr. Ed, on, on, the, on the flip side, there could actually be an increase um, in claims because we know there's a, there's a lag there as well. So... The priority for us was that people actually were taking steps to be proactive and creative environment where issues um, could be notified, getting that confidence to actually... Um, so you're, you say the strategy would would be effective if you saw an increase in the number of injuries. Is that what you're saying? No, so we need, so we need to make sure that workplaces create a, the, the right culture and processes for people to um, raise a, a mental health issue when they have it because that's the first starting point. And then when they have that confidence, then we can look at making sure that later that those claims um, don't arise. So in the, in the near term, we might actually see an increase um, in complaints while action is taken because of the lag effect. Have you done any modelling that might suggest that you'll see this bump as you kind of you know, raise awareness, you see an increased level of uh, notification and reporting, uh, uh, workers' comp claims, and then it'll taper off. Is there any modelling to support that that underpins the strategy? So I'm not I'm not aware in, in no, no, the no, specific strategy, modeling, but, but, as a, but as a regulator, that's a that's a very common modelling model that we would have um, in other industries which I regulate. So building, for example, um, we know there that we're not getting um, the complaints aren't equal to the amount of um, defective buildings out there. So we've got to increase the number of complaints and at the same time reduce the number um, getting in the system. So we have to have this. Um, two-pronged approach where we're not just focused on preventative, we're not just focused on claims, that we're keeping um, an eye to both. Mm. And Mr Deadam, as we pointed out, in, I think in the opening question, there are a lot of contributing factors that, that lead to increased psychological claims. Um, we obviously mentioned increased awareness as, as part of that, as Mr Press touched on, but also obviously the impact of the pandemic and the economic strategies um, that impact on both workers and, and businesses. Uh, it was not. It was decided that the regulator can't take responsibility or necessary measure our success based on claim numbers alone. Uh, what we can do is proactively drive action for employers, and that's why we we set this benchmark of uh, sixty thousand businesses um, taking effective action, uh, and we've delivered on that um, to our expectation and, and, uh, and exceeded that to reach the sixty-two thousand target based on our, mm. our sampling survey of this year. But I think further to your point, given we're now at the end point of that strategy and we're thinking about what next, we may look to have something more um, uh, claims orientated because we have, um, if, the, if the data is correct, increased that awareness and, and given that sort of good foundation to, to think about something as a higher level objective. Given that the, there's a much higher incidence of psychological injury in the public sector, why are you pro directing your regulatory focus in terms of mentally healthy workplaces to the private sector? Like It seems like there's, there's a glaring and obvious problem that requires 
attention in the public sector, yet your focus is on the private sector where the problem is perhaps less acute? Our strategy looked at both public and private sector and provided support and assistance to, to all employees, including the public service. We did, however, direct our funding and our financial support to small and medium businesses because we feel they need the most support and assistance to, to comply um, and also to take action uh, in relation to mentally healthy workplaces. So our, our free coaching service and free training services were dedicated towards small and medium businesses, up to 200 workers. Um, however, our resources are just as applicable to large private sector and large um, government sector agencies. And, uh, and we also worked on things like the People at Work tool, uh, which was supported by all regulators across the country, which is very applicable to the government sector. Uh, and we also we have our regulatory um, responsibilities. So um, government agencies are large employers, and we do expect government agencies to, to have the resources and the, and the capability to, to manage their own health and safety risks, and, and we use our regulatory tools to help drive Clearly that they're not, not managing it particularly effectively when it comes to psychological injury, don't you think? Uh, and certainly, and when we, be, when we establish evidence to, to take action, as we did with Sydney LHD, um, in the terms of the enforcement undertaking, we will take action. But on a systemic basis, there's no, there doesn't appear to be any strategy. Is there any work being done to develop a strategy that might deal specifically with the psychological injury problem in the public sector? At the present, we're at the end of our Safe Work New South Wales roadmap um, that completed this year. Um, as part of that, we also had a government sector work health safety plan. Uh, which held all secretaries to account to report against um, their performance, including a number of indicators in relation to mental health, violence and, and, and other factors. Um, those secretaries at the secretary's board um, would report back on their, their measure and their performance against that. What work... Are, sorry, I'm, I'm happy I've to... I've got a couple of questions. Yeah, but if I'll ask one more question one. about uh, the... Uh, what work are you doing uh, around the implementation of the Code of Conduct... <coughs> uh, in the public sector, is is that something that you're proactively ensuring that agencies are properly implementing the code of practice in relation to managing uh, psychosocial hazards at work? So the code of practice is now um, just over 12 months old, and the regulations are um, we look commenced on the 1st of October. Both of those have been we've been through a phase of raising awareness, both with public and private. Um, employers uh, and on the back of our awareness raising phase we will be increasing our regulatory activity. Uh, we see the regulations and the code of practice as a fantastic opportunity now for us to clearly define what our expectations are which we haven't had in the past uh, which will enable us to take more um, or more assertive um, regulatory practice. For example I, I mean coming back to the education sector you know what work would you be doing to make sure that the education sector is actually <coughs> applying the code of practice, doing the risk assessments, putting in place the hazard controls. So we might we might so sort of speak to where we, we are trying to get um, more assertive. I think, as Mr. Kelly saying, that's a good word in this in this government space because, the, as we've spoken to, the data shows they 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 have, do have a higher incidence of claims. So we just recently launched a program working in the healthcare sector. We're visiting um, Mr. Kelly twelve or so. Uh, public and private yes, hospitals. public and private ho hospitals um, looking at violence in hospital particularly, um, seeking evidence on their control strategies, speaking to staff managers and that sort of thing. And so that's the type of approach that I'd like to see more of going forward in other sectors like education. So in the health sector, I think you mentioned uh, an enforceable undertaking. Did you give any contemplation to uh, pursuing the officers of the department, the senior officers of the department, they have a specific exposure in terms of their responsibilities. What, do, do, was there any, any consideration about you know, going to the secretary and putting some enforcement action on the secretary for their failure to adhere to their duty of care? It would be based on evidence. The investigation stream, which we don't manage, um, we're responsible for con consulting with legal counsel and it's routine practice to consider um, officers as part of the investigation process. Uh, so absolutely, I would expect that that would have been considered and, and if there was evidence available um, to a reasonable, um, to, to enable reasonable prospects, then, then I would expect the legal counsel would have advised us again um, to, to pursue those matters. On this occasion, that wasn't pursued. Um, yeah, yeah, Mr. Right. Fowler, yeah. Thank you very much. Just interested in terms of your inspectorate and how it works. like. I have very much the view, Mr Press, in terms of your construction division and how that would work in terms of sending inspectors in, having them assess the site and look for workplace health and safety issues. Just interested in terms of how does it work when it comes to a psychological um, injury assessment 
in a workplace, in a presumption? Is it is it going through policies? Like a lot of the stories we've heard, of course, are about workplace bullying and the like. I imagine they're not things you sort of get from walking through a site and sort of having a visual inspection. So just interested in terms of how that process works. Yeah, talk through, Jim. Yeah, yeah thank you. It, it, various psychosocial hazards, there's, there's many different types of psychosocial hazards, as you can see in our code of practice. Um, so a most common complaint would be a bullying complaint in organisations. So I'll use that as an example. Um, we don't get involved in terms of the conflict itself and playing a mediation or arbitration role. That's certainly not our role. Fair Work Commission can play a role in terms of that, but that's certainly not ours. Um, in the first instance, we do expect the, um, the worker to raise the concern in the organisation and give the organisation an opportunity to, to resolve the issue. Um, so that's one of the, the triaging questions we will ask is, have you raised this with your employer? If they have and they've failed to get a, a suitable outcome or a reasonable outcome, then we would tend to, um, to start the investigation process. Um, in order to do that, we would obviously look at um, do they have a policy and procedure for investigating um, interpersonal conflict or bullying type allegations in the organisation and has that been followed? Um, so in order to determine that, we would obviously look at the procedures and the, and the policy. We would interview the, the worker um, if, they, if they're happy to, to go on the record and not, not remain anonymous. It's quite challenging for us to, to take anonymous complaints, but we can do so to, to some extent. We'd also consult with the health and safety representative to, to get feedback on um, are there other bullying type issues across the organisation. Um, we will also consult with the employer representatives to look at their evidence to show that they have followed that policy and procedure um, to, to reach a suitable outcome. Where we see failures in, in terms of inadequate adequate policies and procedures, we may issue an improvement notice, or where the policy and procedure hasn't been followed um, as, as um, determined by the organisation, we may issue an improvement notice as well um, to review their system of work to make sure it is followed moving forward. And what about in the proactive sense in terms of actually going onto work sites and looking for potential issues into the future? Do you undertake that through going through and looking at the policies that they have in place or the education programs they have in place with staff? How's that, how's that undertaken? We certainly do. We, we tend to do it more in the, in the higher risk areas, so um, not so much so... In, and what in do you deem to be the high risk areas? I think Mr Amato asked before in terms of sectors to our last witnesses as to whether there are any sectors that they found to be high risk. What do you, while answering that, if you want to maybe outline what you see as the high risk sectors when it comes to psychosocial injuries? So as Mr Press pointed out, um, violence in the healthcare sector uh, at present is certainly top of mind for us. We've had a number of incidents in, in the violence sector, both in public and private hospitals, probably more so in the public hospital system. Um, so that certainly is, is a high priority area for us and we're proactively um, visiting workplaces now to look at the systems of work they have in place to prevent and manage um, violent acts or behaviour in the hospital system. Okay. Um, and, and back to, sorry, the proactive approach that you take and how that's undertaken in terms of looking at the policies that might be in place and the education, how, do, how does that work? So again, it's tailored to the, to the hazard. So in the case of violence, we would have a, a checklist that we would coach and mentor our inspectors and, and not just our specialist inspectors, but our general inspectors would be supported in, in doing a, a proactive visit to a healthcare facility in this case, um, addressing a number of factors that we would think uh, would be um, compliant with the code of practice and, and the regulations around managing the risk of violence. Uh, the same would apply if it was to do with um, high, high job demands, for example. In the, in the matter um, example that was raised earlier, we know certain um, organisations like professional services, for example, mm. um, are not managing um, high job demands proactively and we would expect them to do so. So we would have a system in place to, to proactively go out to businesses that we think are at risk of, of um, high, high job demands or, or excessive stress um, on their workers to see how they're managing those workloads. Thank you. Do you think, just taking some points from Mr Farlow and Mr Diadam before, um, so do you think that um, that mental health issues are uh, more underreported in small businesses than in, um, than in the public sector or large businesses? I think it's difficult to, to comment, to be honest. I think it's, it's across the board, I would expect. Um, personally, I'd expect government sector to be better at... at um, eliciting reports of psychological hazard, hazards and harm and having better systems in place than what small and medium businesses would, uh, but we haven't researched or, or, or tested that theory. Fair enough. In the strategy, um, the, in the June 2021 strategy, um, there's references made to um, direct practical coaching and also tailored support for small businesses. Um, you, can you talk a bit to those two initiatives? Yes, certainly. The um, direct practical coaching is delivered by a third-party vendor of ours. Um, it's essentially a, a team of organisational psychologists that can provide 
tailors support and assistance to small and medium businesses, um, regardless of, of the nature of, of the mental health issue they may come to. So uh, we try, we've learned from experience that um, we need to meet the customer at the state of where they're at. So that could be um, they're ready to implement a, an action plan to create a mentally healthy workplace, or simply they're dealing with a person who's disclosed a mental health issue in the workplace and they're not sure what to do with it. So the coaching service is, is anything from a 15 minute consult to a four hours over a period of weeks where they can consult with an organisational psychologist and get coaching and mentoring and support to manage um, the mental health challenges they may face in the organisation. So it could be to deal with the pandemic and the economic challenges they're facing, or it could be to deal with an individual who's disclosed mental health and they want to support that individual in the workplace. And the strategy also looked at regional New South Wales as well. What do you think are some of the key differences between um, workplaces in... Um, in metropolitan Sydney versus those in, in regional New South Wales? I think one of the key differences is, is the challenges they face in regional New South Wales from a, a natural disaster perspective, as we, yeah. we all know, um, but also from the economic challenges of, of lockdowns and, and the pandemic itself. Um, accessibility to both to um, mental health um, services, um, clinical services, as well as um, even access to GPs and doctors can be quite challenging. So. When an employee um, discloses mental health um, to an employer, the employers really don't have a lot of support or assistance to manage those um, issues, and that's where the coaching service comes in handy. Um, I should also mention our training service, which we engaged um, in the Black Dog Institute to provide training for small and medium businesses, has been really well received and, uh, and reached some substantial numbers as well. Uh, that empowers employers and employees to have those conversations around mental health in the workplace, which certainly helps to raise awareness, but also to support early intervention, which, which we know reduces the cost and duration of claims when they do choose to lodge a claim. Mr Donnelly. Thank you, through you, Chair. Just return to this area, just for clarification's mm -hmm. sake, and sorry, maybe I just uh, haven't quite picked it up. In terms of safe work, um, um, when uh, in my earlier answer, or in your earlier answer to my question, <coughs> you went through um, and, and usefully and helpfully divided it up in, uh, there was two construction, uh, uh, two work health and safety other one explosives and one hsd um, now is that um when you add that up that totality is that called the regulation division that is what we know as the regulation division um no so that forms a part of this this sort of organization called the better regulation division right so uh, well, let me ask another way is there actually something called the, the regulation division or that regulation division, in fact, is the better regulation division? I think that... That's probably the answer yeah. to that? Okay. So, so in, in, the, in, the, um, in the staff that I look after with Mr. Yep. Mr Kelly, that is essentially all of the Safe Work Inspectorate plus the Fair Trading Building Inspectorate in, in one function. Okay. Can I, can I add, the investigation stream also does have Safe Work Inspectors operating in investigations capacity. Okay. Um, so with respect to that earlier uh, point we are making about the uh, People Matters survey, um, um, on notice, um, um, if you're able to provide that survey, now that's an annual survey, is it? Is it not? Correct. So um, there, there obviously would be a, a, a 19, uh, 20. Do you, you operate on fin years or calendar years? Or the surveys are generally run in October. Uh, okay. So um, October, if you could provide October 19, uh, October 20, October 2021, and obviously the current ones uh, obviously presumably under preparation, that would be helpful. Um, Can I just, sorry, correct the record? I think it's running in August. The results are made available in late October. Oh, okay, just fine. Just for well, clarity. By, by, well, by, by the time, well, certainly 19, 20, 21, and, and maybe if luck's running our way, we might have 2022. Um, just on this matter of the um, ha uh, described as the sort of uh, uh, hands-off approach, if there's internal complaints to deal with it, okay? And I think you uh, indicated that the um, uh, if there's an internal matter, there is a, a, another department. Was it um, the resource regional regu resources regulator? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering. Um, this is just a, a case study example, perhaps, if you could. Um, help me understand the resolution of it. Um, sorry, just the Secretariat. If you just provide the gentleman with a copy. Okay. 
So uh, uh, if you look at the document, uh, you. Uh, which is headed, uh, it's on New South Wales government letterhead, Safe Work New South Wales and Improvement Notice. Uh, the ref number on the right hand side is uh, 7 38 mm -hmm. 7097. Um, now, that uh, was an improvement notice made. Um, to the Department of Customs Services by Safe Work. If you look down the bottom, uh, it was the 26th of the 11th of 2020. That, 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 in fact, when the inspector actually prepared the paperwork, if you look up further, the inspection uh, appears to be have taken place on the previous day. Uh, that is the 25th of the 11th of 2020. Um, and then going back down to the bottom of the page, this contravention must be uh, remedied before, and then there's the date, the 26th of the 2nd, 2021. Uh, and then if one looks at the body of the document, at the brief description, um, you, you'll see uh, in the first sentence, workers may be exposed to the risk of uh, the health and safety as there is an ina inadequate system to investigate reported issues of bullying in the workplace. And then if you go down to the next box, which is a little bit bigger, it's a rectangle, I should say, directions uh, as to the measures to be taken to remedy, etc. Now, with, with a matter like that, um, how are we able to be sure, and, and can you explain to us how we can be sure, that this matter was, was duly followed up and, and, and who would have done that? And particularly with respect to the, the re remediation um, required to have been done. Now, if you, if you have any direct knowledge of this particular matter, I'm happy that you sort of acknowledge that. Um, I, I'm vaguely familiar with this matter. It, it, I haven't re refreshed my memory, but um, the, the inspector it was one of our, our specialist inspectors at the time. Uh, was one of our, sorry? Was one of my specialist inspectors at the time, special yeah. psychosocial inspectors. He was, okay, yep, yep. Um, this matter was not in the better regulation division, so we deemed it um, as, as something we could investigate and not refer to the Department of Primary Industries. Um, this was part of the Department of Customer Service, but not part of our division. So we felt we were far enough removed in order to, to investigate the matter. Um, I don't recall exactly what division it was within, um, unfortunately. Uh, the notice was issued, obviously, by my inspector to the um, executive director in the department. So, sorry to interrupt, but in your earlier explanation, uh, earlier in the session, you, you didn't in any way qualify the um, uh, arm's length dealing with complaints. I, I did say where there's a conflict that's identified. Where there's a conflict, right. Well, um, how, how would you explain that there wasn't a conflict in this case, given that he 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 was employed directly by you or accounted directly to you? And, and can I, sorry, just to jump in, obviously with something this specific, if you did want to take it on notice, you're free to do so. I don't know how familiar you are with this particular issue. Sorry, Greg, well, I just no, that's to, right. do, well, you know, spring it on them with a oh, well, no, piece the, of paper. The, and, the gentleman, yeah. obviously, uh, 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 and I'm happy to take it on notice if, if, if necessary. This inspector was employed by myself. Yeah. Um, the worker who raised the complaint was not uh, and was not a member of our d division. So I just so didn't I think, Mr. Donnelly, that, that the separation that Mr. Kelly is trying to point to is um, safe workers within the Department of Customer <coughs> Service, a, a large cluster department, and this, this complaint or this matter was not within um, our part of the organisation. So it was not within the, the Safe Work Inspectorate or this Better Regulation Division, which combines Fair Trading and Safe Work. So on that, but I'm not sure where they were within the Department of Customer Service, but Mr Kelly is saying that there was an assessment that because it wasn't uh, within our division, if you like, it was another part of the entity, um, that there was sufficient separation. Does that, does that help? Well, um, yeah, I just struggling with the, um, the demarcation line, I have to say, in my mind if it's all within the Department of Customer Service. But in any event, sorry, you were explaining about the matter. Just to So there's there's 14,000 workers in the Department of Customer Service, so we don't refer it, um, all matters to the Prime Industries regulator um, as part of our memorandum of understanding. That, that would be unreasonable for, for, for them to take on those matters. Mm -hmm. They're the mining regulator, first and foremost. Um, so what we do determine, based on um, an assessment of conflict, um, would be whether or not we can manage it ourselves or, or, or not. On this particular example, it was a routine bullying allegation. 
Uh, we did look at the, the information that was made available on the internet, as, as it refers to, and, and deemed there was room for improvement. And we issued an improvement notice to the to the um, executive director for people and culture. Uh, and that, um, based on the response to that improvement notice, um, we deemed that they, um, they they complied with the improvement notice, and the matter was closed. So, you determined. Sorry, just. To, who determined that the matter was satisfactory to resolve? So he made a determination that the matter was resolved. Uh, she did, yes. Sorry, I beg she, your she, pardon. She, um, she was satisfied that the improvement notice had been complied with. Okay. Now, just on the matter of, of the uh, People's Matters Survey, our understanding is that in, in 2019, 2020, uh, there was, uh, s s s the results show that 16% of uh, safe works operational staff uh, said that they had been bullied or been subject to bullying at work, 16%. Now, does that figure register to yourselves? I mean, 1920 wasn't that far ago or not far back. A 16% figure is, is a pretty high figure. It's pushing towards one in five. Does that figure ring a bell? I've been concerned about the, the reports of bullying and witnessing bullying for, for a number of years and, and, and the figures have been similar to those for, for a number of years, so I'm certainly conscious of that. So, so, so one in five, or, or close there to, um, you would concede a, you know, not insignificant figure, is it? It's 20% almost. You acknowledge that. So in terms of your statements you just made about it, it's, it's been like that for some years, quoting back to you your words. How long has it been like that for, to the best of your knowledge? I, I think across the public service has been concerning whilst... No, I'm talking about the area that you have responsibility for. I don't have responsibility for the Department of Customer Service. Well, uh, we have a, a People Matters survey and you say that that survey does not apply to you? That survey applies to my 70 staff that I mentioned in my stream. Correct. Um, and I don't believe that 16% in, um, of my results would reflect that. So you're, sorry, so I'm not, not being cute here, but you're, you're contesting the 16% figure for the for the year 2019-2020? No, sorry. I'm responsible for the Health and Safe Design Directorate, of which 70 staff belong to. Yes. And um, we would not have had a 16% report of bullying. Right. The Department of Customs and Service may do, which is a question for the Secretary in terms of um, right. What's she doing to manage that? So, with respect to the area that you have responsibility for, um, is there a, a, a figure available for that? A bullying figure available for that that's there, produced? There would be. Yes. I don't take that on notice. Take <coughs> that on notice. And, and for the same period, if you look at uh, uh, 19, 20, 21, and 22, uh, that would be appreciated. Yep, appreciated. certainly. We're almost at an end, unless there's any final question in the, in the last minute. Um, I just, uh, yep, Mr. I just uh, have just been looking at the answers returned by um, Tony Williams, who I think maybe was your predecessor. Is that right, Mr. Fair, uh, Press? Uh, in uh, an answer returned in uh, estimates that goes to the question, I think uh, Mr. Roberts asked about uh, psychological uh, hazards and enforcement action. Uh, there's da there was a data table provided on the number of uh, improvement notices, penalty notices and prohibition notices. I wonder whether you might, on notice, uh, provide a breakdown uh, of those figures and if you've got 2022 figures, include those. Uh, how many were public sector? How many were private sector? So that we can get a sense of where the emphasis is in terms of the enforcement action that's being taken around uh, psychological Hazards. Yep, don't let us. So that's on, uh, I'll just give you the reference. It's on page uh, 19 of the answers provided uh, to uh, questions taken on notice on Friday the 11th of March by uh, the then Minister for Fair Trading and Small Business, uh, Ms Pedernos. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for attending this hearing. Committee members may have additional questions for you after the hearing. 
the committee has resolved that the answers to these, along with any answers to questions taken on notice today, be returned within 14 days. The Secretariat will contact you in relation to these questions. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, Committee. You. Uh, could each witness, uh, starting from my left, please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Darren Parker, uh, Executive Director, uh, Workers' Compensation and Home Building at CIRA. I'd like to take the oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Good afternoon, Adam Dent, Chief Executive of the State Insurance Regulatory Authority. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Would either of you like to start with a short First opening thing. statement? Yes, thank you, Chair. Dent. Uh, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to leaders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room today. I'm pleased the committee has focused the 2022 review on psychological injury. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to add to the discussion on this very important issue. Today, around 8% of all New South Wales comp workers' compensation claims relate to a psychological injury, compared with about 5% a decade ago. People that suffer psychological injury are less likely to return to work and more likely to experience an adversarial claims journey. While much of the public discourse has focused on the growth in these claims, the interface between the workers' compensation system and mental health is far more complex than that. In fact, the group that experience the worst outcomes are those with a physical injury that require psychological services as part of their recovery. People with a physical injury claim lose, on average, six weeks of work. For psychological claims, the average loss time is 20 weeks. Somewhat alarmingly, people who access psychological services after a physical injury are off work for an average of 31 weeks. The reality is that poor mental health is more prevalent among the workers' compensation cohort than the broader working population. A recent Australian Council of Social Services report showed that one in 10 wage earners in Australia report high or very high levels of psychological distress. CIRA's own research shows that one in five workers' compensation claimants have a probable mental health illness based on the Kessler 6 scale. Making a claim in any compensation scheme can lead to worse health outcomes. Factors such as high case manager turnover, low workforce capability, investigations, delays in making decisions and accessing treatment can all contribute to psychological distress. In designing a new workers' compensation scheme, we have the opportunity to respond to the changing nature of workplace injuries and add to the elements of the system that can cause or exacerbate mental health conditions. In the meantime, people suffering mental ill health must be better supported by the current workers' compensation system. There is a wealth of evidence that shows us how to do that. In simple terms, high quality case management delivers better outcomes for all injured workers, and it's particularly important where mental health is a factor. There's also plenty that insurers can and should be doing. For example, they can screen for the risk of delayed return to work and psychological distress, and they can develop tailored pathways and hypercare arrangements where those risks exist. Insurers can minimise exposure to friction points by focusing on the right things early in the claim. And they can make attracting, training and retaining capable case managers a top priority. 
In fact, CIRA is actively considering credentialing case managers to lift the standards across the industry. We've provided evidence-based advice and set expectation, expectations through guidance notes, through our standards of practice on managing psychological injury claims and return to work and early intervention. We're building the capability of health providers, targeting employers through a range of advisory, compliance and enforcement efforts. CIRA is also piloting our outbound assistance service in the workers' compensation scheme, similar to what already operates very effectively in CTP. We're partnering with a number of insurers that agreed to participate, and the early indication is that workers are valuing the contact and feel more confident about managing and navigating their claim as a result. Getting good outcomes for workers suffering mental ill health is challenging for many reasons, but it is the core role of the system I regulate to help people recover and return to work regardless of the nature of their injury. At a minimum, my expectation is that all insurers follow the evidence and lean into this issue. Thank you again for the opportunity to address the committee today. Excellent. Thank you for that opening statement and for your very detailed and balanced submission. Um, I wanted to start by asking about the McDougal review. Um, how is the progress or what, what are your views on the progress uh, being made on the implementation of the McDougal recommendations? Um, it's an excellent question. Thank you for, for asking. At the moment, the bill is still before the parliament um, at this point in time, as far as we're, we're concerned. There's a draft bill that, uh, that reaches in and addresses the majority of the issues uh, considered by Mr McDougall in his report. Um, I'm waiting somewhat anxiously for, for that report, for that bill to make its way through the parliament. Uh, I think it will actually address most of the issues. There are other areas that we're still looking at nonetheless. Um, there are a number of benefits issues that we're following up and doing more work with stakeholders on presently. Um, and we're also in the process around uh, looking at the, the, essentially the restructure of the Act and the rewrite of the legislation um, in, the, in the bigger sense. So recommendation 34 was targeted at how we look at consolidating the legislation. So Sarah's working on all of those, but real, realistically, uh, it's the second reading speech in the Legislative Council we're waiting for. The obviously one concern is the, um, the claims costs within the within the scheme. In particular, you have um, quite concerningly the insurance ratio, um, which was 123 percent in May 2021 and 105 percent in May 2022. In your in your submission, um, is that of concern to CIRA? And what are some of the drivers behind that? Um, uh, behind that insurance ratio? So it remains a significant concern. Um, the fact that it's dropped from 120 to 105, and I think Mr Parker is currently sitting at 102. That's right. Um, so it continues to decline. And um, we were deeply concerned at the point of the McDougall review, and we've had a continued decline since then. So I think that, that remains uh, one of the most significant issues in the scheme. There's a number of factors that drive that. Um, claims management is one of them. Um, Another has been the, just the investment performance, so that's obviously a consideration that um, needs to be, to be taken into account. But also, uh, premiums make, make the difference too. And at the moment, we're under-collecting, or iCare is under-collecting on their premiums. So it will take an incredibly long time, I think, to turn around that insurance ratio at this point in time, so it, we remain considerably concerned about that. Yeah, so nobody wants to push up premiums either, so that's, uh, that's obviously a problem. Um, any observations about the government's announcement on Friday about the new claims service providers? Um, I know it was a long time uh, coming, moving from one to, what is it, five now? Um, yeah, any any uh, thoughts on how that might improve the scheme? Look, it certainly has the opportunity to. Our concern is making sure the implementation of that change now uh, happens effectively. We've been monitoring and working with iCare to understand their process. I am encouraged uh, about the level of detail that um, iCare have entered into in terms of making sure that process works well. The onboarding of insurers over the next 12 months will be, will be critical. Getting the technology right is going to be critical. They're essentially unravelling where they took the technology for a single claims provider. Um, I think any degree of competition is worth, um, is worth looking at in that, that space. What concerns me is how quickly new, in, new entrants will be able to build capability. Um, so that's why we're considering credentialing around case managers. We do know that an experienced case manager can get a 20% better outcome in terms of return to work uh, on average than somebody who is inexperienced. New, new entrants into the scheme will 
hopefully um, have people who have experience, but it's hard to see how that will work easily. So from our point of view, we'll be watching it very, very carefully, um, making sure that the risks are mitigated along the way. My view is we cannot experience any further declines, um, and so we'll be looking to make sure that's the case. I have a few more, but I might uh, hand over some of my colleagues and come come back oh. later. Uh, questions from other committee members? I might just jump yeah. in with one Carlo? quick one um, on this. So we heard from uh, the Law Society, um, the Barristers Association and Australian Lawyers Alliance earlier, disputing, in a sense, the rise in psychosocial injuries and claims in the workers' compensation scheme. Um, looking at the data you've presented and as you did and outlined, I think it was a 5% to an 8% increase earlier. Um, the data from iCare effectively backs that up as well. Just interested in your perspective on that evidence we've heard earlier today. Um, having not had the advantage of being able to listen to it at that point, um, I, <coughs> I think the facts speak for themselves. Um, an increase from 5% to 8% is, is nearly double. Um, so there certainly has been significant growth. That said, um, if it's stabilising, that's possibly a good thing, but uh, I don't think we've seen any evidence that would suggest that yet, and certainly not in a systematic way. So the rise uh, is really quite important, and the fact that it is double, while it's still only 8%, given the cost of those claims, I think we've got right reason to be concerned. So I, I invite Mr Parker to make I think the observations here. the time you talked about as well, in terms of somebody who has psychosocial injuries, that they're off work longer, okay. if that's coupled with a physical injury as well, it's an even longer period for return to work, which is of concern. And an, av an average that's over six months is definitely not, not a good story for either the claim at all for the scheme and its sustainability. So, okay. Did you have any yeah, thank you. Mr Farley, I might draw you to the um, our submission. It talks to the very point that you're raising and the two data points I'll draw your attention to. First one is on page 21 of our submission that talks to the number of new claims. And from 2019-20 to 2020-21, there is an increase in claims um, from 7,532 to 8,311. And you'll also note this is talking about um, new reportable claims for the nominal insurer. For the same year, it's increased from 3,807 to 3,906. 3, so at the front end, there's an increase of new claims by about 100. But then if I draw your attention to um, the next page, which is 22 of our submission. But as a proportion, it's not. If I... Yeah, I'll get to the proportion as well. Um, it talks about the total number of active claims for the same years. So if you look at 2019-20 to 2020-21 of active claims, the increase in total has gone from 7,814 to 20,603, and then for the nominal insurer, at the front end we saw for the same year an increase of 99 claims, but the number of active claims has gone from 7,623 to 9,131. So the front end you've got a, a shift of about 99, and then the active claims in the same period has gone up 1,500 or so. So, so it's actually went up during the COVID period. That was that time, yep. yes. Yeah, yeah, during that time. Do you know whether it's related to uh, COVID, mm. the psychological injuries? But obviously, pe people are under a lot of stress. Happy to take that on notice, although um, anecdotally, I would suggest that the majority of the COVID claims um, were actually reasonably short and inexpensive and mostly related to time off work for illness. I don't think that there's evidence that COVID significantly contributed to changing the overall balance of mental health claims. Yeah, but if you take that on notice, you have to do to know that's all. Yeah. We'll get the breakdown. But the active claims metric really could be reflective of worse claims management processes, though, surely. Yeah. It's, not, yeah. it's not indicative of an uh, actual rise in the number of psychological claims. It just means that you might be, you might have uh, claims that are taking longer to resolve. And therefore that's correct. That is growth. Is there a question? No, that's just throwing it back. I was saying, is there a question... Your well, I'm asking, favorite, I'm asking favorite, whether that's uh, the case, whether it's the case that the, uh, the active claims uh, figure is, you know, a result of increased overall claims or is it a result of poorer claims management? I'd suggest it would be a combination of both of those things. So as Mr Parker indicated, there was a, a small increase in the number of new claims, so about 99. <coughs> but broadly, um, the total number of active claims continues to grow, which means there are people who have not exited the scheme for one reason or another. 
it could be case management, um, and quite highly likely to have been case management as one of the contributors, but also the nature of the injury that the person suffered. Because the proportionality does decline, doesn't it, Mr Parker, in uh, between 2019 and 2020 and 2020 and 2021, that's 7,532 over 94 versus 8,000 <coughs> on 99. So it's the overall proportion is declining, isn't it? So the, the proportion, the, sorry? The proportion of psychological claims to overall claims is declining in that respect. Yeah, and I think that goes to the... Uh, over the last few years, there's been a stabilisation of the number of total claims. So if there's been a increase in the percentage of... Uh, new claims, that could be contributed to, to also the reduction in non-psychological claims as the denominator. And just interested also in terms of um, when we look at the, the areas where this is most prevalent, like the large growth in, like while well, they've all doubled, but just the quantum in terms of the Treasury managed fund that 27% are um, of active claims are for uh, psychological claims. Um, what do you attribute that to? Certainly, um, the nature of the work um, that the Treasury Managed Fund insures contributes considerably, so that the highest rate is within the stronger communities cluster, which includes police. New South Wales Police yep. uh, and the corrective services. You've then got health and education, um, so it's not unexpected that t more TMF claims would, would exist for psychological, just given the nature of the work. Um, it is a stark difference, though, I think it's fair to say. And, and But do you do a breakdown in terms of those claims as to what they're attributed to? So, for instance, like bullying claims or the like, as well as um, just broader... Uh, in a sense, the pool of psychological claims itself might be a little bit too broad to tell us where some of the challenges That's might right, be. and we do we do have um, an, a little bit more detail. Did you want to take that? Yeah, Mr Farley, so broadly, um, four out of five are related to um, harassment, bullying and uh, excessive workloads. The one in five is more related to response to a traumatic um, event. Incident on the hospital. So arguably preventable. Sorry? So arguably four out of five would be in the preventable category. Yes. And that it's not a, a direct trauma. Well, that leads me, in a sense, to being um, even more concerned when it comes to the Treasury Managed Fund than the 27%, in a sense. So I can understand that one in five, so to speak, and why there'd be an uptick there, but then the four out of five and what sort of practices may exist there that are leading to a higher claim of psychological injuries, which is a concern. I agree. Um, Mr Donnelly. Thank you. Um, we had uh, some representatives in this morning from... <coughs> Say broadly speaking, the legal field, barristers, solicitors, pick bodies, and uh, we had an exchange about <coughs> uh, how things have changed from I use the uh, term the, the old days, the good old days, the old paper files, um, and in those when a, a claim was made, a workers' compensation claim, there was a workers' compensation claim form that the injured employee would get from the employer. That there'd be the completion of that. There'd also be a, a, a record kept by the uh, employer and, and a collection of quite significant detailed information. Even if those who were asked to put it together weren't aware of it, they were actually putting down quite detailed information at, at, at the time on a round normally when the, uh, the uh, accident injury took place. Uh, and the effect it was that that was a collection point that was pretty much at the start or pretty close there too. And that then followed the whole matter through. It became a, a key source of information, which would inform all people who, who had an intermediary, intermediary involvement or participation in the process. Um, it was explained to us this morning, uh, and I have to confess I wasn't aware of this, that um, these days um, that's not done per se. Um, that, in fact, it was described to us that there is a, what's called an electronic uh, notification of a claim which is made, which seems to be, what well, sounds to be almost like almost a perfunctory exercise of alerting the claim was being made. <coughs> anyway, as we went through the evidence this morning, um, the point was made and, 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 and remade about how that lack of collection <coughs> at the early stages, uh, and this is my word, not theirs, it acts as someone as a handicap to a degree, uh, in that 
there could be, um, because of lack of information through this system, the electronic notification system, um, a re-asking of the injured worker, and I think you know where I'm getting at, what I'm getting at. So I'm just wondering, uh, have you had this brought to your attention, or has it been raised before, or if you've got to take it on notice, take it on notice, that, that with respect to, to this system, and obviously we, we move towards obviously utilisation of information technology, we're not going back, um, whether though there is some argument about this electronic notification uh, system that we've got uh, to be refined to hopefully improve in that um, upfront collection of information. Um, I think it's a really important issue that you've raised. Uh, the legislation doesn't require a claim form, uh, and I think it sounds like such a simple, simple thing. Um, the, re the employee is required to make a notification of injury, and then the employer is required to notify the insurer by, by whichever means they choose. So I think you're absolutely right that that therefore leaves a considerable gap. There are some circumstances where um, certainly CIRA prescribes a minimum amounts of information that should be collected, uh, nonetheless, no matter how it's done. So we've got guidelines on those around the notification of injury and, and claims. There are times where a claim form is required. So <coughs> an insurer must require a worker to fill out a claim form when a reasonable excuse notice has been issued. The worker is seeking payments of compensation and the reasonable excuse is still relevant. So that's one of the circumstances. Or where the, like, the compensation is likely to be claimed beyond the provisional liability limits. So essentially there is an opportunity for that, um, but it's not a requirement all the time. And listening to the, the evidence this morning, it sort of struck me that that does feel like um, an area, of, an obvious area for improvement. From my point of view, it's precisely to the claimant's experience that you've just discussed. Yeah. The, the process of having to tell and retell your story is not a good one for anybody. And I think in Sarah's work to try and look at where we've got friction points, with the words we're using to describe it, that would be one of those. And I think it could be solved not by necessarily going back to paper forms, but a digital claims form yeah, no, of no. some sort mm. that did capture that minimum uh, information that could then follow follow the claimant through is an excellent idea and certainly something we'll now look at. Yes, no, I wasn't suggesting that we go back to the way it uh, uh, was once done, but but certainly in, a, in another life I was involved in, in managing injured worker claims and um, invariably when you sat down you would take detailed notes and, mm. and of course, that became a, a sort of a, a mine of information which would then sort of follow the claim and uh, where appropriate and as necessary would share that information that would help move, move things along. Um, but just to the extent that, that's, that there is only very modest collection up front, um, that would even seem to, to make it challenging for anyone getting involved at almost any point of trying to establish with some level of sophistication the details around the claim, be it a physical claim or a, a psychosocial claim. Yeah. I might just add that I'd, I'd also expect that one of the things the insurers and claims managers should be doing is keeping good records so that even if it isn't collected up front, which I, I agree is it's probably sure. a problem, yeah. one would hope that as information is collected through the claim journey that that is kept in a way that it's more accessible when there's a change of claims manager or a handover to another professional. So I think there's there's an opportunity for, um, certainly for insurers to do that well, but starting with the claims form of, um, that, of, that collects the right information up front is definitely worthy of our time. As the regulator, don't you have uh, capacity to make sure that the insurers are collecting the correct information? Yes, and we have, we've issued guidelines to that effect and we uh, absolutely make that part of our audit manual. I think what's important is around when that information is collected to, to the point it probably could be done better up front than it, than it apparently is right now. But certainly our guidelines do stipulate what should be collected and when, just not the form. I think the key in terms of that observation is really about the uh, trying to ensure that the information about likely disputed claims uh, in, mm. in the context of psychological injuries, that that initial information, that contemporaneous yeah. observations were critical in terms of trying to avoid a situation where there's, uh, you know, some contestation about uh, whether the, uh, the claim arose from a work-based uh, incident. Um, just in terms of that, I, I wanted to ask about the what you think are the measures that could be taken to minimise the level of disputation about the acceptance of psychological claims. What do you think is the, the, the pathway forward? I mean, it's, there's clearly a higher incidence of disputation when it comes to psychological claims, 
what can be done to improve uh, the system at that point so that you know, the worker journey is much uh, smoother. Look, to the first part of your question, I think um, it's difficult to see a psychological injury in the way that you can a physical injury. So I think that it, the inherent nature of the injury type means there is going to be more questions to ask and therefore that creates the opportunity for, for the dispute to arise. Um, so I, I think as unfortunate as that is, uh, a broken arm is a broken arm and it's very hard to dispute that to some extent, whereas a psychological injury, um, there becomes an opportunity for more subjective, subjective views and that's where that would come from. So that would be difficult to necessarily change. My view though really is there is the opportunity to make sure the conduct of the caseworker and the case manager uh, is effective and that they understand how to approach um, the injured worker more effectively. So our standards around managing psychological injury claims, our standards around those early weeks of a claim are an important instrument I think we have to drive that. We're focusing on compliance on those issues now more than ever before and the rolling audits that we'll be undertaking over the nominal insurer over the next uh, 12 months will focus on issues like that. And those first sort of four to eight weeks of a claim are really, really critical for getting that right. Uh, so we'll be looking at the conduct of insurers in relation to, to how they're handling that early stage of the claim. I think that, that's where the opportunity is for it to probably go the most wrong. The use of investigation um, and IMEs is also something we're, we're concerned with and keep an eye on. But I think there are a lot of opportunities where it could go wrong. So there's not really a simple answer to how we reduce that other than absolutely every effort should be made to do so. So in terms of the... I suppose I'm curious because it's not really an insurance situation, is it, where... The, I mean, the claims managers, they don't actually have any skin in the game. They're just managing the claims process. The actual insurance side is uh, that, that liability is with someone else. Uh, so there must be something in the incentive system that's obviously Sierra has put in place that uh, incentivises a higher level of contestation around psychological claims. Do you want I mean, to my first, so my first response would be, would be fair, I think it would be unfair to say written. a caseworker does not have any skin in the game. I think that that's, I know what you mean, but I think it's unfair to necessarily say that. I think the well, they've the got a contractual relationship with with uh, you know the, the nominal insurer or, or the like. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the actual claims manager, the EML or whoever it is, they don't actually have any liability. They just have to deliver on their contractual arrangements. So there must be something in the contractual arrangements, uh, which clearly is within your. Uh, you know, uh, authority to regulate what, what goes into those contracts, what kind of incentives are put in place uh, around so the claims management process. That's not actually something we have an authority over. Um, the way those contracts are constructed is a matter for iCare and its board. I'd, I'd suggest Mr Harding this afternoon may have some, some better answers for you on that. But no regulatory capacity to... to, to on how uh, iCare procures the... and contracts with a case, uh, case management agent? No. Right, OK. Can I ask about uh, the, in your uh, submission, you talk about the, the data that's collected by CIRA, giving you a good oversight of the system. And we had safe work in uh, earlier. Uh, obviously, they have a role in terms of the sort of preventative side. Uh, and the data that you collect uh, on, um, on claims obviously would provide some guidance to them. Perhaps you, if you could elaborate on the, uh, the approach in terms of data sharing uh, that exists between CIRA and SafeWork as the safety regulator. Um, I'll, I'll answer the first part and I'll ask Mr uh, Parker to talk about how we make that work operationally. Um, all of our data is available on our open data portal for anyone to see. So that same work, that same data is available to SafeWork as well. So we. Um, we're probably the more transparent jurisdiction in Australia around, around data, around claims. So um, I think it's fair to say we share as much as is possible and SafeWork would have access to that. Operationally, we do partner with SafeWork on a range of issues. So Mr Parker, I might ask you to speak to how we do that. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the data analytics that we've done is to, uh, to assist SafeWork to identify what are the priority industries that they want to focus on for the year. And we had Mr Kelly and Mr Press talk about that today and that's the, the annual report that they focus on with their inspectors going out to those locations. In addition to that, um, uh, Mr Dents identified return to work as a priority for this year and has created a new inspectorate for CIRA. 
And what CIRA is using is its own data analytics, whether it's tip-offs, whether it's complaints, for CIRA inspectors to go out to employers that are a high risk of people that are injured. There might be some difficulty that we are predicting that they'll have difficulty getting back to work. And it'll be our inspectors will go out to those sites and have a discussion with those employers and if necessary, either educate or use the enforcement powers. So uh, in terms of TMF, clearly there's a much higher prevalence of psychological injuries. Why isn't there regulatory focus being placed on the public sector to improve its uh, its performance in relation to psychological injuries? Like the, it's clearly a problem and it doesn't seem to be getting the requisite attention and it's having an impact in terms of the operation of the workers' compensation scheme. I think the... the uh, the government has invested significantly in the mental health at work strategies for government. So the, the current strategy runs until the end of this year. Um, I think it's fair to say it clearly hasn't done the job that we needed to do. Um, but there, I, I don't think it has not had attention by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there's been considerable time, effort and energy um, put into that space. We've responded by changing and issuing new standards of practice that would then apply to the TMF as much as they do any other employer. Our current uh, set of audits is looking right across the TMF, so we're now auditing um, all 10 clusters across New South Wales to look at the, how their, case, their claims are managed, so that is a, and a focus of them will be psychological injury. It's such a significant draw on the TMF that it has, has our attention, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't know whether you say, were you, did you hear the evidence earlier from the, uh, the various members of the legal uh, fraternity? I was only able to see part of that. Right. There was a discussion about lump sum settlements uh, and psychological claims. I wonder if you might offer some comments about that. It seems like the system structured in a way that uh, means that um, psychological claims that often uh, it's highly improbable that the worker will return to work and so they sit in this situation where they're on weekly benefits for a long period of time. Uh, no prospect of returning them to work, and that's obviously contributing to adverse uh, an adverse impact on return to work rates. Uh, is there a better way in terms of trying to facilitate easier exit from the scheme uh, for workers with psychological injuries? One of the areas in the McDougall reforms is around expanding the ac access to commutations, which are currently reasonably limited. Um, we have not yet finalised that into, a, into the bill. It was removed uh, before it made it into the lower house uh, earlier on. So we're continuing to work with stakeholders, including the legal profession, on how we can expand access to commutation. I think the reality is, in most cases, somebody going out of the scheme is a better outcome than them staying in it. So I, I think it's an area that um, we will hopefully see over the next 12 months some significant movement on. Um, that piece around commutations is probably the answer and giving people the opportunity to have their independence earlier where it's appropriate and upon having got the right advice, both legally and financially. But certainly it is an opportunity for, for us to expand that. Uh, the representative of the Bar Association also made an observation about uh, the, I suppose, the um, lack of success or less, lack of emphasis on retraining and redeployment assistance. Perhaps you might offer some comments about where, where we're up to in terms of that uh, form of assistance being provided through? I think that's an, uh, it's a really important observation and I'd agree with it. I think as we start to look at how we redesign the scheme into next year, these are areas that need to be, need to be written into the legislation. We need to consider how these responses can be made. When you particularly think about the challenge, particularly with psychological injury in small business, there's nowhere for somebody to go back to work. So retraining and redeployment is going to be the better outcome. Um, you may ask Mr Harding this afternoon on some of the work I care does in that space. I'm not overly familiar with it, but there is some. But I think there is absolutely an opportunity to do that differently. I was re talking about this with somebody recently and put, you know, the former Commonwealth Employment Service um, was somewhere you used to go even if you had a job and you wanted another job. That's this, there was a system that was far better at helping people find work when they needed it. That doesn't really exist today in the way that it used to. So. Um, my view is as we start looking at the next generation of what workers' compensation looks like through the reforms that will hopefully take place over the course of the next couple of years, that's an area that needs focus. It, it's clearly underdone. Um, any uh, comments on early intervention uh, in the workers' comp scheme? Uh, I've seen your submission, and I didn't know this before, but um, there already exists... Um, 
legislative framework for um, eight treatments without pre-approval for three months, medical expenses of up to $10,000, um, which seems um, which seems very good um, that uh, that workers can get um, pre-approval for um, psychological support. Um, but we've also heard from a lot of witnesses about um, about the importance of, of early intervention as, as an important way of, of getting you know getting people back to work as quickly as possible. Any comments on um, on on uh, yeah on early intervention? Um, other than to completely agree with you, uh, our standards around early intervention really drive home the importance uh, of getting the claim right early. In 2015, nine out of 10 people returned to work within 13 weeks. That's now eight. So that that has declined over the last five years. We know it leads to better um, outcomes and it's measurable and the evidence all supports that. So our work on new standards of practice, um, 34, is really focused on driving that with insurers to make sure they are doing more early. So while there are there are definitely benefits available. Partly that comes down to does the injured worker fully understand and know? Have they been told what's available to them? Um, if they're accessing that, um, then that's it's going to get a better outcome. So from our point of view, um, it's it's absolutely critical. Those first weeks make all the difference in terms of the claim. And it's obviously cheaper to the taxpayer too if, um, you know, talking before about the increase in claims costs, it's not just, as Mr Adams said, about... Um, the number of claims going up, but it's the expense of each claim um, and getting people to work as quickly as possible can reduce the, the you know, the, the cost per, per claim. Um, the, That's the right, and we'd want them to get time. well and get yeah. back to work, not just get back to work. So that ideally uh, the, the claim will be managed so well that that happens. So that's absolutely true. The cost of those claims when they drag out to over 31 weeks on average is so clearly different. There was a graph uh, in the submission that I think really starkly showed how if early intervention happens, uh, the cost of those claims are considerably lower. Um, the bar that then almost didn't look like it would fit on the page um, is where early intervention doesn't occur in terms of access to psychological support. So it makes a huge difference in terms of what premium would need to be collected. So the, the scheme would be more sustainable. Employers would be on the hook for lower premiums. And more importantly, injured workers would be well and back to work. So th there's really um, so much evidence to support the early intervention approach that we'll continue to focus on that. Yeah, and more like I suppose more likely to have a, a secondary um, uh, psychological injury the longer that the claim goes on as well. Because at that point, you're possibly in a more adversarial um, part of the system. Um, you've probably had multiple claims managers. So all of those factors that we know um, impact someone's likely recovery start to play out when you're, when you're in the system for that long. So the, uh, and the secondary psychological injury claims are the ones that drive the costs uh, quite substantially. Mm, yeah. Further questions from committee members? Mr Donnelly. Thank you. Um, can we just go to your uh, supplementary submission or the document that updates the uh, <coughs> uh, first submission? Um, and specifically, could I please take you to page uh, 19 of the submission, the, uh, the chapter which commences uh, immediately, <coughs> uh, the previous page responding to psychological injuries. But on page 19, um, in the right-hand um, column, it's got targeting employers. You see that? Yes. Um, now, I won't read through that, but I'd just like to ask you a, a couple of questions, if I could. Um, in that heading, or pe perhaps if I let you just spend a, just a moment just having a look at it. So... Um, <coughs> sure. Um, so... Within that heading, the reference to inspectors running down under that heading, th these are s safe work inspectors. Is that what you're referring to or there are other inspectors? There are now other inspectors. One of the 10 actions CIRA undertook before Christmas as part of our 10-point return to work improvement plan was to engage our own inspectors. We work with safe work quite closely. Safe work inspectors do do visits on CIRA's behalf uh, to employers and the uh, historically, that analytics work that is referred to there in the third paragraph informed how Safe Work did that uh, from us. We now have a small team of inspectors at CIRA who are doing this work specifically, um, using our, uh, our 
sort of greater level of knowledge, if you will, and focus on return to work rather than the broader range of things that a safe work inspector would be spending their time on. It's a small team at the moment, it's five. It's essentially part of the pilot to determine whether we can get better outcomes um, by having that team of inspectors um, being part of CIRA. Um, with, with respect to the, um, the CIRA, uh, sorry, r r rather safe work uh, and uh, its inspectorate, which has component parts, but within those components part that they're inspectors. Um, do you have any knowledge um, or information that's been collected by, by yourselves, by CIRA, uh, about the amount of, of work that's done uh, by the inspectors with respect to dealing with psychological injuries? Um, have you been able to garner an assessment independent yourself of, dare I say, the amount of inspectorate work or inspecting work that uh, work, uh, work, work safe doing in regards to these types of injuries as opposed to physical injuries? Um, I'll, just looking at Mr Parker, see if he knows more than I do. The short answer is no. I don't have a, a great degree of visibility over that at all in terms of the work no. that SafeWorks undertaking. Um, but I can also happily take that on notice and well, come back to you. Yes, yes. Um, can I just ask you, going back to this uh, fourth paragraph of yours about the inspectors, um, um, <coughs> with respect to those inspectors that you now uh, employ, there's no confusion between the inspectorate or the inspecting work they're doing, I think you said that's associated with return to work, and the inspectors that safe work have, which are probably have a broader would have a broader remit. Uh, confusion, no, in the sense, unless I misunderstand your question, uh, but given that we work closely with and provide the data to safe work to drive where yeah. their inspectors visit for return to work, the safe work return to work team, um, that group of inspectors would be We'll be doing that on the basis of the active conversations we have. So that's every month. Um, but we we don't really then have visibility on what they might have done. No, sure. But there's no evidence of confusion about who it is. Um, no, that's the okay. The inspector arises, arrives. Jump in on this. So is it correct that uh, Safe Work is funded through the scheme? Is that right? Is there a proportion that's of funds? Yes. Wholly funded? Um, I would have to take the detail on notice, but I believe SafeWorks operations are fully funded through the scheme. Fully yes. funded. And it seems from evidence that's been provided in estimates that SafeWork as an entity doesn't really exist, that its its inspectors are uh, dispersed across a range of functions, including fair trading, compliance work. Uh, how do you make sure that the expenditure on Safe Work is dedicated to health, a primary emphasis on health and safety and meeting the needs of reducing injuries in uh, uh, in New South Wales? We don't really have a power to determine what safe work does effectively with the money that we're required by the legislation to provide them. We have um, on, on numerous occasions worked with safe work to fully understand the spending and each year the conversation around the budget is a detailed one um, when we determine what funding will be provided. So I, I've, I've no reason to believe the money isn't being spent on safe work, on safe work activity. Safe work is uh, you know, a part of the Department of Customer Service and is in the same division as Fair Tradings and, and other regulators. So you're quite right that there there are people who would have multiple roles, but there are also some really quite focused employees in that group. So I don't have any evidence to support that it's not so being spent appropriately. Though, but I don't yeah, I don't have visibility of that. That's right. So uh, do you think that uh, the, the, that separation of safe work uh, from when, when work capital was broken up into the th three uh, entities, do you think that, that that's something that perhaps should be revisited? That given that you're starting to create your own inspectorate, it seems like there's a, there's a level of duplication that's being creeping back into the system that kind of suggests that that original idea of separating the two regulatory components into two separate entities needs to be revisited. Do you think that's... Um, I think it's reasonable to say that we need to, I mean, we need to obviously never uh, in, in, engage in investing in duplication. That's not a good outcome at all. The safe work inspectors do have such a broad remit and a bigger role that this pilot for me was about saying, can we get a better outcome if we're doing it in a focused way at CIRA on return to work? Safe work has the prevention responsibility as well, so their work would be directed 
at making sure all workplaces are safe generally, we're quite specifically focused on our employers meeting their obligations around return to work, and that's what our inspectors would focus on. If, if that works, um, if that pilot is effective, it would potentially be a conversation around where, where the rest of that return to work work is done, whether that all got brought into CIRA, uh, or whether there would be lessons we'd learn around how we'd ask Safe Work to do their work differently um, based on this pilot. So we're not committed to, to continuing this arrangement as it is, but it's certainly worth looking at. What's the enforcement mechanism that these inspectors use? What's, what's the source of their power? Do they have some, some mechanism to issue notices? Or yes, yes. The, the, the Act provides, uh, there's a series of offences that a penalty notice can be issued and then we can take further, um, further enforcement action if required through courts, uh, local court generally. Um, some of the fines would range from sort of five or so penalty units up to up to 100. So the Act actually envisages, envisages you having inspectors? That's Correct. Right. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any information, um, and if you take it on notice necessarily, um, please feel free to do so, do you have any information about um, what we understand are uh, delays to uh, psychological assessments in the Personal Injuries Commission? I don't. I, I, um, unfortunately, the work that um, okay. the judge does there is not something I'd have access to. Take that, uh, take that on notice. And this is related, and perhaps might be the same answer, perhaps different. Um, uh, question about what, why is there what appears to be a shortage of doctors uh, to assess claims um, in the Personal Injury Commission? I, I would have to take that on notice. Okay. Then matters to the judge. Any final questions from members of the committee? No, I'm okay. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your uh, time today. Uh, committee members may have additional questions for you after the hearing. The committee has resolved that the answers to these, along with any answers to questions taken on notice today, be returned within 14 days. Uh, the secretary will contact you in relation to these questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you very thank much. You very much.
started. I would now like to welcome our next witnesses. Um, thank you so much for coming today. If I could uh, ask each witness starting from my left to please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation. Thank you. My name's Rashi Bansal. I'm the Group Executive for Insurance for New South Wales and HBCF at ICARE. I'm taking an oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Good afternoon. Richard Harding, CEO of ICARE. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare <coughs> and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mary Maney, Group Executive of Workers' Compensation for ICARE. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Would you like to start with a short opening statement, Mr Harding? I would, please. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, ICARE welcomes the opportunity to contribute to the Standing Committee on Law and Justice uh, review of the Workers' Compensation Scheme, and I thank the committee for inviting us to appear today. Workers' compensation serves as a critical safety net to protect the welfare, productivity and prosperity of workers and businesses across our state. While the nominal insurer is the largest of more than 70 insurers, it, with around about 67% market share, iCare principally covers small to medium-sized businesses, making up over 280,000 of the 330,000 employers insured. As a result, we do not represent the entire scheme. Around 17% of the market is covered by self and specialised insurers, mostly consisting of larger businesses. We would welcome further input from the self and specialised insurers who, play, who, who also play an important role in this space at future hearings to ensure that the committee gains a view of the whole scheme. As workplaces and society at large experience unprecedented change, workers' compensation needs to change with it. Several submissions to this review have highlighted the significant upsurge in mental health cases. This is presenting unique challenges for compensation and care schemes across Australia and internationally. Recent reporting on mental health by the ABS tells us that 8 million Australians have experienced a mental health condition and around 2.2 million were reported in the last year alone. Analysis of long-term data <coughs> by Professor John Buchanan and his team at Sydney Sydney University School of Business suggests that over the past 10 years, the increased focus on physical workplace safety has seen a decline in, in physical injuries, which typically have shorter and more defined paths to recovery. The scheme has largely been successful in its desired outcome of supporting these workers to recovery and return to work. The increase in psychological claims, which by their nature are far more complex in response, treatment and recovery, means we need to shift the focus, identify the key issues and address the genesis of the problem rather than simply re react. As the CEO of iCare, I'd like to offer a few observations. The growth in claims <coughs> and the challenges we're experiencing in return to work rates reflect the conflict factors underpinning mental health issues. There are external elements stemming from changing labour markets, industry structures that play a role. As participants in the scheme, we can become overly focused on short-term issues and fixes. However, it is important to keep a clear eye on longer-term environmental factors that will allow us to improve the scheme based on contemporary and data-driven outcomes. Importantly, return to work needs to be viewed as a recovery ecosystem. Insurers, employees, employers, the regulator. Every relevant stakeholder has an important role to play and it's important we work closely and collaboratively towards better outcomes for all injured workers. Limitations within the worker compensation system itself, which is inherently modelled for physical and not psychological injuries, continues to present challenges for insurers. So too does the natural adversarial approach and the prescriptive nature of the legislation. We will continue to engage with all stakeholders to support legislative and regulatory reform that might improve this approach and mitigate inflexibilities that ultimately impair outcomes for injured workers. In relation to the impact on our delivery of services, the additional recovery time for psychological injuries is stark. Under the nominal insurer, 42% of psychological claims reach 12 months duration, compared to 72% of injury, uh, physical injury claims, 
in the TMF, 40% reached 12 months duration compared to 15% of physical injuries. This additional time is reflected in co claims costs, which on average are four to five times higher for psychological injury claims, exceeding $137,000 per claim in the nominal insurer and over $200,000 per claim in the TMF. While it is important to understand the challenges, there are opportunities <laughs> for positive change. The workplace is often seen as a space that creates mental health pressures, but it should also be considered a space where support, prevention and early intervention can mitigate mental health injury risks. The workers' compensation system clearly has a role to play here, which is why, in collaboration with organisations such as Black Dog Institute, other government agencies and leading mental health experts, we offer a range of initiatives in early intervention, education and prevention. Those programs are outlined in our submission. We are also looking at making changes to our business to improve the way we work with employers and workers. We are developing a new workers' compensation claims model for the nominal insurer, moving from a single service provider to a network of many. A key element of this new model will be to provide more specialist support for injured workers with psychological injury. Further, iCare has developed a set of professional standards for case managers with a view to drive improvement in both the capability and capacity of the industry in New South Wales. These professional standards create career pathways and professionalise the industry and will help case managers gain greater skills to be able to work with injured workers, including those suffering from psychological injuries, return to health and return to work faster. While a number of key stakeholders have shared responsibility for positive change in this space, iCare is committed to being a leading force for continuous improvement, ultimately delivering the best possible outcome for the people of New South Wales. We welcome this review and I thank the committee again for giving iCare the opportunity to contribute. I look forward to taking your questions. Great, thank you so much for appearing today and for your very detailed submission and also for the um, answers to our pre-hearing questions. So um, very helpful in us understanding the scheme in more detail. Um, I wanted to start off by asking um, where things are at with implementing the McDougal review, um, any challenges that you see um, or how you think the scheme will improve once those um, recommendations are implemented. Thank you, yes. Uh, we are well progressed in addressing the McDougal review and the, the many recommendations. There are over 107 recommendations that we're tackling across both uh, Mr McDougal's review and the uh, governance, accountability and culture review that was undertaken by PwC at the same time and supported his review. Um, early on in the process, we established two major pieces of work across the organisation, one uh, which we call the Enterprise Improvement Program, which deals with governance, risk and accountability, and the other being a nominal insurer improvement program, which deals specifically with the issues uh, of how to lift the performance of the nominal insurer. Uh, in both, we're well progressed. We provide regular reports through Promontory, who's our uh, assurance partner, our independent assurance partner, on our website on a quarterly basis. Uh, and we are well progressed, especially in regards to uh, matters such as the governance and risk management side of things, the improvement in our culture, uh, and the development of increased capability across eye care. Uh, with respect to the nominal insurer improvement program, uh, again, a lot of progress has been made. There are uh, six work streams that are relevant to the conversation today. All of them have some element that relates back to uh, psychological injury. The first is around return to work, and that is, if you like, our short-term focus on how do we work with incumbent uh, claim service providers to help improve return to work uh, processes and to lift return to work outcomes. And I'm um, uh, comforted to say that we're seeing uh, what we would call green shoots in that area. Lifting return to work in a scheme such as this is a long-term endeavour. It's not something that's going to happen through a silver bullet overnight, but we are seeing some improvements uh, in both the four-week, uh, the 13-week and the 26-week uh, measures at this stage, and that's, that's encouraging to the work that's happening in that work stream. The remainder of the work streams are then all about larger structural reform to the scheme, primarily about the changes that we announced last week in respect to um, claim service providers. We are looking to move uh, the scheme from one single service provider, being EML, uh, to six. Uh, and in doing that, we are also uh, embedding a, uh, a structure that also targets 
introducing specialised claim support for uh, psychological claims. So four of the six providers that we announced last week uh, will target both generalist and specialist approaches to uh, psychological claims. And we're also talk talking, with, talking with one further uh, <coughs> provider who will aim to create a specialist capability on its own. Um, that process involved a significant, uh, highly compliant New South Wales government procurement process. Uh, and as I said, we announced that uh, the outcomes of that last week. The effort now falls to transitioning and implementing that in a way that results in the minimum amount of disruption and the maximum amount of benefit to uh, the participants in the scheme and primarily to injured workers. We're doing a lot of planning with uh, the new CSPs to make that come to life. Um, the biggest focus we have there is to uh, not replicate what happened in 2017 and 18 uh, and to make it into a slow, deliberate uh, and phased progression. Uh, we aren't seeing a big bang on the 1st of January. In fact, we will look to probably only start moving uh, new claims uh, from middle of, uh, middle of the March period uh, and introduce one claim service provider at a time uh, so that the shifts in the uh, claims portfolio, if you like, are not dramatic and don't have the sort of impacts that we saw mm. uh, in prior, prior processes. Um, so that work is, is ongoing and there is an enormous amount of planning and an enormous amount of work to be done there. Um, the other work stream that is important to mention is uh, what I mentioned in our opening statement around professional standards. And if you look at the reports from both Mr McDougall and Janet Dorr, who CIRA commi commissioned a report from prior to McDougall's review, case managers are the key to return to work uh, irrespective of the type of injury uh, and the relationship that they create and the effectiveness they have working with the injured worker uh, is key to getting people back to work. Our goal is to establish a set of uh, industry-wide professional standards that help lift that capability. One of the impacts that happened in 2017 was a lot of capability exited the market uh, and was redirected by insurers and others to other products and services that they offer. Um, our goal is to lift that capability, create more capacity uh, and create pathways for people to join uh, the workers' compensation scheme and system uh, and see a, a career path to growth and fulfilment in that, uh, which we think will be um, a very big impact on the scheme. It also enables us to monitor and manage claim service providers to ensure that they are meeting those service standards, uh, and, and we will publish that on our website as part of their performance criteria in terms of the development of their people uh, and how they're attracting and retaining uh, key talent. So that, uh, that can't be understated as a key part of the model that we're bringing forward in in uh, the change process. Uh, so there's a lot of activity going on, on across iCare from uh, changes to the board right through down to the, to the level of case managers that I just talked about. I'd be happy to talk longer, but I'm conscious that I've probably wrapped it on too long. Um, so yeah. but thank you for the question. <laughs> that was a very, very helpful overview. Um, just to address um, the insurance ratio, um, I think uh, we're on estimates where, where it came up. Um, but uh, as part of this hearing, it's, I think it would be good to, to address as well. 123% um, in May 2021, down to 105% in May 2022. Welcome your um, comments about, um, about the challenges in, in, in addressing that. Yes, certainly. Um, <coughs> it's clear that uh, the, you know, the normal insurer uh, in particular uh, is in a place where we would like to see an improved outcome across the board. I think the message that I was trying to give at uh, Budget Estimates is that's something that is going to take some time uh, to, to realise. Um, of the result that we saw at 30 June that generated the insurance ratios that you're talking about, uh, uh, the negative result was at around about $993 million in terms of the, uh, the overall result for the nominal insurer. $892 million of that was investment losses driven by uh, investment market volatility. We take a very long-term view on investments uh, because that is the nature of the scheme. The average duration of a claim is in excess of eight years and we uh, manage our uh, investments to that similar sort of duration. The 10-year return for the Workers' Compensation Insurance Fund is around about 5.9%. 
uh, and that exceeds our benchmark uh, by more than 0.1 of a percent over the same period. So we are comfortable that the investment return, uh, whilst volatile given the nature of investment markets at the moment, uh, is doing that right job that, it, that it's supposed to do across uh, the scheme. We also saw over a billion dollars of uh, adverse movement from uh, increases in inflation, and primarily this is about wage inflation, and I'm sure it's not, um, uh, it, everyone will be aware that one of the biggest things we do is pay wages for injured workers. Uh, the assumptions that drive the valuation for claims liabilities from an actuarial perspective uh, previously had an estimate of around two to two and a half percent wage inflation that was lifted by the actuaries to between three and three and a half percent driven by current market activities. Uh, and that's an overall uh, over a billion dollars of impact. Uh, the other movement which is of interest is about $153 million of psychological claims increases. Um, and that obviously relates directly to the outcomes that we're talking about here today. The longer claims, more complex claims, uh, and uh, obviously higher cost. Um, and there being more of them. Um, from a point of view of addressing the, the current position of the normal insurer, we have a plan where we are attacking all four levers across the, across the scheme. Um, obviously, premiums is one element of that. Uh, and I have always said that we need to address premiums. Uh, there has been eight years prior to uh, me joining uh, the organisation where premiums have been held flat. Uh, and that's been a great boon uh, for, uh, for New South Wales businesses. Uh, but there is a need now to address the gap between uh, the current premium level and the break-even premium level, uh, which is around about 18%. We also need to address uh, our own cost base and I've had a program in place to address that through identifying over $100 million worth of costs, which we have achieved in the last two years. Uh, but that is also part of an effort to build in uh, a focus within the organisation on continually thinking about costs and how we can manage and better improve our own cost base. Uh, the last part is obviously claims management. Um, and uh, I've talked before about the case, uh, the work that M Mary's team has been doing on the changes to the claims model, uh, improvement in case management, the focus on return to work, and all of those uh, elements of how we are attacking that. Uh, and then the final piece of the puzzle is what I mentioned earlier, uh, is the investment returns. So our strategy and approach is to attack all of those uh, levers. Um, but as I said at the beginning, this is a long-term game. It's not, uh, there's no turnaround in the, that you're gonna see in a short period here. Um, we have to be persistent and consistent in our approach. Uh, and really seek to see the scheme recover and become far more sustainable uh, over the long term. Thank you. I'll um, open it up to other committee members to ask questions. Okay, I might uh, uh, kick off uh, just with a question about uh, a suggestion <laughs> in the uh, Rehab Providers Association submission about mandating uh, appointment of a rehab provider uh, where the return to work is not expected within four weeks. I wanted to invite some <coughs> comment from uh, from ICARE about that proposition. I'm um, happy to answer that. Um, Mr. McK Mr. Deadam, we, um, we've uh, conducted some, we've got some pilots running at the moment in relation to um, rehab providers. We, um, we believe that workplace rehab providers have a you know, necessary role, and especially in um, facilitating return to work. In terms of mandating um, on all matters, what we've, we've currently got a pilot um, running where a rehab provider is actually looking at, um, it's, a rehab provider has been engaged and looking at machine learning and are trying to identify whether er areas um, should be which which matters should be referred early, and based on those referrals as well, they're also they're not suggesting that every matter should be referred. So I'm happy to present um, that material and present the outcomes of those pilots once they're completed. But I would say, in terms of should it be mandated, I'd probably say there are certain circumstances where um, mandating workplace rehab providers on every single matter is probably not the most effective way to return, um, to, to focus on early intervention. I think they have What's to be... What's the downside? 
Well, the downside would be that in some cases they're they're just not they're not ready to be appointed. So if we might have injuries where people are having surgery, there's a delay in treatment or intervention because of their their injuries and nature of the injury. Mandating on workplace rehab on every single matter may not be appropriate. And the other the other <coughs> point to note is that. For um, most, well, a lot of our claims actually do go back to work without workplace rehab provision. Without and it, or did you say? Without it, because yep. there's facilitation with the injured worker, the um, nominated treating doctor, and they'll work together to actually facilitate that return to work outcome. In those cases, it probably would be adding another intervention that may not, that may not be required. I, so, I think, Mr Adam, one of our premises that I talked about in the, the opening is the prescriptive nature of the scheme at the moment sometimes restricts the case manager from doing their, from doing their job. Our goal is to lift the case manager up and get them educated and uh, having a career and get them to build a set of capability so that they can make the best decisions in partnership with the injured worker, the doctor and the employer. The case right. manager... Not, yes. not necessarily, you know, uh, from the workers' perspective, not necessarily on their side. Well, it's, so part of our goal is to get the human skills into the case manager, that that can be much more of the case. They are there doing a, a facilitative job across a tripartite, right? The, the issue there is then at what point does a rehab provider need it or not need it? And that can be a conversation between the treating doctor, the injured worker, the case manager, and have the best outcome. When we prescribe things and mandate things, we generally end up with a worse outcome because you lose flexibility and you lose the ability for judgment to be made by those by those how's people in that conversation. How's a rehab provider going to provide a worse outcome? Like, how is that? Why would they? What kind of intervention that are, would be uh, undertaken by a rehab provider could lead to a deleterious result? Well, if if we work on the premise at the moment. The majority of, of injured workers get back to work without the need for a rehab provider. That would suggest that there is an unnecessary intervention being made that's not necessarily going to add value. Um, so I, I think you've, you've got to look at it in the context of current results. Uh, you've got predictive analytics, so perhaps maybe not the four-week threshold that's been suggested by the Rehab Providers uh, Association, but. Uh, uh, perhaps there's some other metric that could be applied in terms of uh, well, I, I where, when a rehab is, provider should be uh, uh, engaged in a case. I think the point that Ms Maney was making before is that it's more often likely to be about the type of injury or the individual that's participating, the, the injured worker and their current state of mind and, their, and certainly their relationship with their employer. Mm. Uh, um, so I think it's not necessarily a time period it is about the type, and that's why I'm suggesting to you that case managers need to be able to apply their judgment uh, in supporting the conversation between the doctor, the rehab provider and the injured worker to make that happen, rather than it being a mandatory uh, case. I think you've got to go with that, that flexibility, otherwise you, you, you're, just, you're just creating a one-size-fits-all process that doesn't actually enable the tailoring of outcomes to the injured purpose, person's needs. Can I ask about, uh, what about uh, in the context of uh, psychological injuries? You've obviously, you know, indicated that uh, the return to work rate for psychological injuries is much, much worse uh, than for physical injuries. Uh, what's the trigger for engaging a rehab provider for a psych injury? Again, so I think one of the things that we would like to emphasise is the complexity of, of psych injuries and you, you, you've heard evidence, I understand, from a number of different bodies throughout the process that would, would support this statement. They, they are highly complex, not just in the injury themselves, but in the nature of the relationship between the employer and the injured worker, uh, and the nature of the relationship between the employer and the scheme, and that's driven partly by the design of the scheme, uh, but also uh, other participants. So. Um, I think we just have to be careful about, again, mandating anything that creates a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, we need to be able to create a model question where... question is, what was the trigger? What, what would be the trigger for you to engage a rehab provider for a psych injury? Like, what's, what's the threshold I, that I you're currently... I can answer that one. 
Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, the trigger would be, it's it's dependent on each case. It may well be that the, the um, nominated treating doctor might be having problems in terms of supporting or finding um, alternate uh, treatment or supporting the injured worker in their treatment. It may well be that um, the employer also needs the support. There's, there's a number of triggers. If I look at the, the most important thing is that we, you know, as Mr. Harding said, we don't take a one size fits all and really focus on what is the best treatment and support for that injured, injured worker and, um, and then how do we actually facilitate, you know, um, early engagement, early return to work and return to health as quickly as possible. But, you know, if I, if I said I, I wouldn't be able to say here are all the triggers, there are a number of triggers. So the, the important thing to note is that we don't um, prevent anyone from, you know, seeing a rehab provider. It's more a case of we'll refer, and the injured worker can also refer to an, a rehab provider themselves, but we'll also, we would refer um, on a case-by-case -case basis and on a needs basis. Can I ask about uh, the issue around retraining and redeployment? So we had... Uh, there was an exchange earlier on with a representative of the Bar Association who suggested that, uh, that there didn't appear to be uh, much of an emphasis on the retraining and redeployment. And obviously, in some circumstances with uh, psychological injuries, uh, return to the work is a, workplace is actually impractical and uh, unlikely to ever to occur. And so, in that circumstances, redeployment becomes the obvious alternative option, what kind of services and support are provided in terms of uh, retraining and redeployment? I wasn't, um, I'm, I apologise, I wasn't able to listen in to the, the um, earlier evidence provided, but um, for the work that we do in terms of retraining and um, offering alternate suitable duties is really I'd say problematic with a nominal insurer um, and the reason for that is if we look at our profile of um, em employers, we have 280,000 employers that have less than 10 employees on their payroll. Offering suitable alternate duties for a small business like that is very difficult. But what we do is we're actually running some pilot on helping career transition, trying to find any other, um, we've got a career transition pilot that's running at the moment. We're also looking at talking to that employer to see what can they provide in terms of suitable alternate duties and we'll continue to, to work with employers on that. But again, I can't say to you these are, you know, I have the panacea or the answer to, to every question. But clearly, uh, you know, in a lot of uh, psych injury cases, return to the workplace is so... You know, obviously, for physical injuries, that, that there's a sort of different there's a different approach that's being taken. But for psych injuries, clearly, there's a need to find alternative employment in a lot of cases. Otherwise, you, you're just not going to get them to return to work, hmm. and so they'll sit on weekly benefits. So surely, there's there's a, a, a need that I care should be addressing in terms of having some structured approach, particularly in psych cases for active labour market work, retraining and redeploying in alternative work. What are you doing? Look, I think there's clearly a need for that and that's, that is where the role of a rehab provider can play uh, a valuable, valuable part. What, one of the things I think that we would also like to see is that there are a lot more work done by employers uh, to reduce the stigma of mental health injury in the workplace uh, that does enable people to go back to work. Uh, one of the biggest issues is that uh, you know, there is a massive stigma around uh, mental health in the in in workplaces, but it, and it's diminishing in the community. But within the workplace, it still seems to be uh, a, a concern. We'd like to see that the development of uh, uh, work around how employers can create the culture where people can uh, take a break from mental health, uh, whether that's a w workplace injury break or whether that's just a uh, mental health break, and still come back to work without that stigma. And I think that. Uh, is a real answer to the solution of return to work for injured people uh, as much as perhaps the retraining exercise because I don't think you can retrain everybody. Um, and there are some psychological claims that won't, won't end up being able to be retrained, right? Uh, 
but I do think that, that there's a combination of things here. And again, uh, you know, in our opening statement, we talked about the fact that this really requires collaboration. Uh, psychological injuries is complex. It requires a change in the nature of how employers view the injury itself, how employers manage those injuries. We need to change our processes, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. And we're looking at that from the point of view of trying to find specialist models. Uh, and we probably need to do more in other, other ways uh, across different stakeholder groups. But I think it's a, it's a combination of these things, not one in isolation that's going to get us through to a place where we get better outcomes for psychologically injured people. I'm looking at your submission and on page uh, 15 there's a table with the 2020 and the 2021 causes of mental health claims. Yeah. And uh, harassment and bullying uh, was 34% uh, of mental health claims in 2020. And 26%. I mean, if you're harassed and bullied in your workplace, you're hardly going to be returning to that workplace. There's going to be an, a natural reluctance from that worker. Like, it seems like there doesn't seem to be an answer coming from iCare about how you handle those cases. Well, when you, so, when, when so return to work at the original workplace is impractical. Can I, maybe if I can just try and come back to what I was saying. So... Uh, um, we now have a scenario. Employers are used to thinking of the idea that they have a mentally healthy workforce, that people walk in the door healthy. We have to get employers thinking of the fact that one in five Australians in any one year has a mental health concern of some kind. It is not very difficult in that scenario for someone who is already vulnerable to be to receive normal workplace feedback and that to then trigger into a case of potential bullying and harassment. This is what I'm talking about when I say it needs to be a tripartite, a three-way conversation. Employers need to get to the mindset of thinking that 20% of their workforce is walking in vulnerable. So the ways we manage our people, the culture that we create in the environments that we work in, needs to take account of that. It needs to change to reflect that. We need to remove the stigma of saying the things that get said around the water cooler when somebody's off work because they've had a stress uh, issue or, or whatever it might be and have a much more adult conversation about it and really try and create a, a, a culture and environment where those things are seen in the same way that a physical injury is seen, where someone's accepted that that's, that's a natural course and we actually work with them. I hear what you're saying. But it's not going to be solved. I, I take your points on board, Mr. Yadam. It's not going to be solved by one thing alone. The retraining exercise is probably part of it, and yes, we probably need to do more in that space. And I think that's a good, good thing for us to take. Perhaps on notice, you might be able to provide us with some t statistics about uh, psychological claims that have been redeployed to alternative employment for each of the yeah, last, yeah. say, five years. How many of those cases have successfully resulted in a worker being redeployed into a different? Uh, di with a different employer or to a different Happy to do place. that and bring it back for you on notice. No problem. Can okay. I also um, add to that, Mr McAdam? We, I do, want, in our submission, we also talk about our... We've got a career transition services that we've piloted. Um, I can also provide the outcomes of those where we're looking at how do we provide career support for those that won't stay at that employer and transition somewhere else and also bring that into the um, material that we provide to you. Okay. Thank you, um, and through you, Chair, thank you all for coming along and uh, appreciate the opportunity to ask you some questions in regards to your uh, detailed submission and your uh, answer uh, and to answer some questions that we placed uh, on notice. Um, Mr Harding, in um, your opening statement, um, uh, you indicated that as a nominal insurer, i just write these words down, that... Uh, I care is not where it wants to be. Um, and uh, you then helpfully went through and identified some elemental parts that, um, uh, in your mind, uh, need some specific addressing. Um, and then in your concluding comments to your opening statement, you, you said that, um, that, that I care needs to become uh, far more sustainable over the long term. Um, is that something that we should be alarmed about, um, to actually hear the phrase uh, far more sustainable?
coming from the CEO about the state of affairs that I care has has found itself in all as is in at this present point in time. I, I think the alarm isn't a word that I would use. Um, I think we are obviously all concerned and working towards improving the outcomes across I care in all in all in all respects across the four different levers that I spoke about in that uh, in that conversation. Um, it's clear that the funding ratio is below our targets uh, and below where we want them to be. Uh, there are a number of factors that have got us there. Uh, some of them are about declining return to work rates. A lot of them are to do with changes to the scheme, changes to the environment that's going on around us, uh, shifting nature of work, uh, as well as, more currently, uh, investment markets, COVID uh, and other impacts. So it's not, that's, that's why I think it's not simple to look at it and say, uh, there's one problem to solve here. And it's also the nature of the beast that uh, turning around and improving the financial performance, if we're just focused on financial performance as a measure of sustainability, but uh, improving that in these schemes is always a long-term process. Uh, you know, if you go back through history, you, you'll see the evidence of cycles of, uh, you know, schemes uh, reform being undertaken, uh, schemes having surplus because the reforms have generated a, a benefit or a re more likely a reduction in benefits to the injured worker. Uh, that then slowly gets eroded over time as uh, governments decide to further expand benefits back again uh, and then there is further reform needed at the end. And that cycle is pretty much repetitive around Australia and around the world in the nature of how workers' comp schemes work. To me, that isn't a necessary cycle. Uh, if we have a long-term perspective on how do we think about building sustainability. Uh, and it is about getting the four levers across the scheme working in tandem together uh, and working collectively, uh, rather than sort of an individual focus on one or the other. Uh, workers' comp is, by its nature, unique in the insurance world in that there are some very uh, um, interested stakeholder groups who have a lot of uh, engagement in the scheme uh, and they have somewhat uh, diverging interests in, in some ways. Uh, and I think we need to get a greater balance of that, a more collaborative approach to working to solve the problems of the scheme uh, to get us to, to move forward. So I don't know if I've answered your question, Mr Donnelly, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not alarmed. I am concerned, as you would want your CEO to be when he's sitting here with the funding ratio below his target, but I'm not alarmed. Just following on from that, you've identified in your opening statement, you've reconfirmed this, about the, the four levers using your, your phrase. Yep. Um, from your point of view, that, that is an identification of, of what you have at your disposal, essentially those four levers. It's not three, it's not five, it's not six, it's... Well, the, the only other level, lever would then be legislative reform, and that, that sits with CIRA as uh, the policy unit. We obviously provide as much feedback and uh, input as we can into that process, um, but that really sits outside my my level of, of control. That's that's something for uh, the government and and CIRA to advise the government on. Uh, but that's the only other lever there is. Right? So we can increase premiums. So there's no, you know, unlike Victoria, so if you look at where the funding ratio is today for New South Wales, uh, I can tell you that in Victoria, the New Victorian government has, has uh, contributed over $800 million to the Victorian scheme. And they still have a funding in the last two years and they still have a funding ratio not dissimilar to ours uh, because of the strains on the scheme from psychological injuries, from COVID, from all the changes that we've talked about. There's not, this is not an eye care or a New South Wales specific issue. This is actually uh, nationwide and actually global. Uh, if you think about mental health, it's a, it's a global thing. In the UK, one in two claims uh, today are mental health claims. Uh, and we want to avoid getting there. Right? We but, want to try and but, how but do we improve that, the way that we get there? But having said that, without wishing to uh, uh, discount or, or, or talk down um, the figure um, in any way, shape or form, in terms of your, your four points that you made in your opening statement, as I understand that you, you said that the psychological injuries are up by $150 million. That's... That's in this that's, year. That's in yeah. this year. That doesn't account for the last 10 years of continued growth in, in and, psychological and, claims. And well, on that point then... Um, What's your prediction um, for the future as best you can look into the future? Because obviously this is long-term as you've described. 
Yep. Um, you've indicated some uh, some matters that are within your direct remit to try and start to to address some of these matters. But what what is the forecasts that I care is using about the next say two, three, four, five years on matters to do with psychological injuries? I, ha I have been on record before of saying that to me uh, the growing nature of psychological claims and the uh, changing nature of the scheme uh, it is one of the, it is what well, is probably the most significant threat to the to the long-term stability of the scheme uh, we are seeing and what I was trying to say in that opening statement you know if you go back to the 70s and 80s there was a huge push around physical safety in the workplace and we have seen that be successful to the extent that a lot of the smaller physical injuries no longer become claims because they're not happening. What that means for the scheme is that whereas we used to have short duration uh, physical claims that would quickly go off and not have a high cost, we now have a bulk of claims that is far more complex than the ones that we would have dealt with before. They're more complex because the injuries are complex in terms of the psychological injuries, but even the physical injuries are more complex. So this is something that uh, the research from John Buchanan at the University of Sydney has been helping us get a line of sight on so we can really understand what the drivers are that are affecting the scheme. Uh, the changing nature of work, as we see the highest growth employment categories in New South Wales and across Australia, again, it's not a New South Wales specific thing, but uh, across the Australian economy at the moment, uh, healthcare, uh, yeah, community services and aged care, uh, education uh, and then professional services. What are the highest areas for mental uh, illness claims? Health care, uh, community services, education uh, and to some degree uh, professional services. We're moving from an economy of uh, manufacturing uh, where physical work was the nature of what people did to a economy where it is about caring, it's about emotion, it's about using your mind to look after somebody, uh, not your body, and therefore the injuries are different and they're far more complex. So in that context, we've got a changing world happening upon us that is driving huge shifts in the nature of the injuries that we're seeing. And we have a scheme that was written in 1980s uh, that was is largely focused on physical injuries uh, and that has a highly prescriptive nature to its, just, to its outline. Well, just on that prescriptive nature, and I know there'll be other questions, so I'll just to speak a final one in, in this round, but with respect to the uh, work being done um, to re reinvigorate and to reform the, the, the claims system, yes. um, can I ask this question? Um, what do you think is uh, uh, perhaps the most significant, I'll use the word in inverted commas, problem or issue associated with the, the operation of the current claim system we have? Um, Be bold, I'm asking, because you, know, yeah, you can obviously have, have a wide perspective from where you, you sit on yeah. looking at this. And, and I might ask either Ms. Bay or Ms. Bansal to, to add to my comments, but because um, I think it's a very difficult question mm. to, to answer because, uh, and I'm just going to divert from you, so forgive me or allow me to just, the prescriptive nature of the scheme itself means that there are so many bottleneck points in the system to, to point at that uh, any one of those I think we could choose as <laughs> the problem, right? But let me try and lift it up a bit to, to that broad perspective there's a reason that we're investing in case manager capability and the reason to my answers to Mr. De Adams' question. That capability to me uh, is fundamental in making sure that we help people get back to work because far more than in any situation with a physical injury, a broken arm, and I'm, this is going to generalise, it's probably going to upset me, but a broken arm is a broken arm. Right? Uh, and there's a well-trodden path for recovery and for treatment. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is clear. Um, that's not the case with psychological injury, right? Uh, and, you know, having a trained and well-developed case manager will make uh, an enormous difference in the treatment and engagement that a 
psychologically injured person receives uh, and the injury management planning and the work with their treating physicians and psychologists and others uh, in terms of getting that person back to health because uh, that's the first step before they can return to work. Right? So we, that's why we are investing in that case management capability because it is, I think, central to mm. getting the right outcomes and getting the best process. But there are a lot of, uh, I said in my opening statement, you know, we, we can get sucked into the minutiae of the scheme because of its prescriptive nature and, tr and, get, and get focused on the little bottlenecks uh, rather than sort of try and keeping it at that bigger picture. What's happening in the environment around us oh, sure. and what's happening at the bigger picture, I think, is, is where we're trying to come from. But I don't know if, if either of you have anything you want to no, I would, add to that. No, I just reinforce in terms of ca the, the significance and the importance of case management mm. and, um, and how important it is that we have case managers who are experienced empathetic and understand that, you know, the, the needs and the support that an injured worker um, requires and also helps to facilitate um, that tripartite engagement with the employer to really focus on early return to work and better, better health outcomes. Mm. You know, and that's the reason why we're investing so much in uplifting the capability and creating those professional standards. If I could, you know, while I've well, I can. Um, the professional standards for us, so really the aim is to move away from creating a vocation to a professionalising the case management industry. You know, at the, I think in the past we had very high turnover in terms of case managers. We still have high turnover. And what we want to do is create a framework where people see this as a career and case management is accepted as a profession and that actually reduces the turnover and creates and allows that strengthening and support for, um, for insurers to, inv to invest in attracting, retaining key staff so that then injured workers and employers get better outcomes. <coughs> Can I ask what's I'm happy to talk more about professional standards in terms of what we've done. In terms of the factors that drive case worker turnover, like uh, in terms of is there any analysis I mean, I, 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 that's a great question. Yeah, is there any yeah. analysis that is looking at, well, what's the experience of the caseworker? Why are they finding the job difficult? Why are they exiting the profession? Yes, I, we've um, we've invested a lot in terms of case management recently through the standards, and I'll, I'll answer that in a moment, Mr. Mr. Deadam. One of the things that we're pleased in terms of seeing the shift in the scheme is that, you know, several years ago the um, turnover rate was, um, you know, it was high turnover, but we now have an, a scheme where um, over 48% of the staff have got more than two and a half years tenure um, in case management. But has there been any empirical or independent um, analysis done on turnover of case managers? No. Um, there's not, I don't think there's anything available. I can tell you from my own experience in leading organisations that had, you know, um, staff that with case management, the um, the reasons why they move is when Mr. Um, Harding was talking about the prescriptive nature of things. If you have an environment where case managers are prescribed every step of the way, can't exercise critical judgment, can't help injured workers find innovative solutions. Um, that actually contributes, I believe, contributes to turnover. And um, the, other, the other key piece is, you know, not investing in case management training and upskilling. You know, and as we were saying before, if we move away from what we have now is an environment where people, it's seen as a vocation to a profession, I think we'll see more case managers um, stay in the industry, which is what we want. You've made an announcement about... Uh trying to create uh, specialist case managers for psychological claims. And there was an observation uh, from a, a earlier participant in the inquiry that that, uh, that might be setting people up to fail because uh, that's, those cases are particularly challenging. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've had uh, some evidence from a round table of workers who you know, had a pretty poor experience of the system and obviously frustrated, angry, uh, and felt that the system wasn't actually there to serve them. Uh, 
I wanted to ask about the, the issue around disputes on liability and the role of case managers in that process. Um, it seems that the, the, the data suggests that psychological injuries have a higher level of disputation, so it's, there's more contention there. Uh, what's driving that? What's driving the higher levels of disputation? Uh, I suppose my secondary question is, why are the case managers there uh, driving a disputatious culture when it comes to psychological injuries? What's, what's incentivising that? Because, I mean... Um, well, I'll try and uh, give you a high-level answer, then I might pass to Miss Maney to, to add more detail. But And just to address, I know that you've met with the roundtable and, um, uh, you know, we're always keen to hear from people who've had uh, bad experiences with the scheme to try and understand what's driving it. And uh, and since I've started, we've tried to reach out to people like that. We've uh, spoken to the Injured Workers Campaign Network on several occasions uh, through uh, Unions New South Wales, and we uh, have our own processes for um, trying to hear and listen to injured workers uh, at the moment, you know, we have a, 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 a customer satisfaction level of around about 71% overall, um, but it is hearing from those uh, uh, minority groups about their experiences, I think, that is important so that we understand uh, the extreme outcomes that the scheme can generate and how we can better um, address those. So uh, there are clearly ways that we can do, do better in that, that context. Um, to your, to your broader question in respect to uh, uh, disputation, uh, I, I mentioned before the complex nature of, of psychological claims and uh, I would say that unfortunately at the moment determining uh, our liability on psycho psychological claim uh, is quite a complex and difficult matter. Uh, we see a higher referral rate to IMEs in those cases uh, because uh, the uh, the case manager doesn't have the skills to be able to um, make that determination or review or assessment uh, because of the complexity of it. The situation itself is complex. Normally by the time the claim is lodged, unfortunately, uh, the relationship between the employer and the injured worker has broken down quite a lot, uh, to your po earlier point about people returning to work. Um, and, that, and that can create difficulty in that you've got necessarily different views coming from the employer and the injured worker about uh, the causal impact. And, the nature of the scheme is one where that liability determination is by its nature somewhat adversarial because of the need to create that causal connection with the workplace. Uh, and, and, you know, that can be something that has where people have different points of view. So that complexity <coughs> is difficult for uh, an underdeveloped case manager to work through and they can intend to rely on IMEs or other experts to try and help them. That doesn't help in the case of an injured work, uh, psychologically injured worker because the more often you ask them to repeat their injury and to repeat the conversation of their injury, you're actually incurring more anxiety and more stress. Uh, and they feel that they're not being believed, which creates, it feeds on other elements of their mental health claim. So uh, it is complex and difficult for a, an underdeveloped case manager to, to manage that situation. Um, I don't have... Uh, a, a more specific answer to that. I don't know if Ms. Maney has something around specific disputes <coughs> arising from liability, but uh, that, I think, is the broad answer I can give you. But what's incentivising the case managers to... Uh, I mean, uh, yes, they're more complex. Uh, presumably, ICARE provides guidance uh, to the claims managers about in what circumstances do you query the liability or... Yeah. You know, uh, so surely we have a, we have a psychological that, that doesn't checklist that to, need to, to be try looked and help at support the case manager to absolutely. calibrate it so that there's less less conflict, less uh, more of a presumption in favour of, of the worker in those circumstances. Isn't that the solution, Mr. At Harding? the end of the day, the liability decision is one structured around the causal connection with the workplace. Uh, and that's the way the legislation works. Right? So that that creates that that if you like, the incentive for What's the evidentiary the case threshold that you have to, the case manager has to reach to conclude that it, there's well, a... It's, it's more work. often than not the conflicting different uh, points of view that are being provided into that conversation, right? That, but at that some stage, someone's challenge. got to make a call. They Absolutely. Either, that, Absolutely. But they could, they could have a presumption in favour of the worker or they could have a presumption in favour of the employer's account of the situation. 
and, and more often than not, it leans towards uh, the benefit of the worker. And we try and move to provisional liability as quickly as we can so the injured worker can get treatment straight away. It's not a case of holding back treatment or holding back uh, funding uh, whilst, the, whilst this discussion is going on, right? We move to provisional liability. That's, that's the, the, it, the greatest use of it. Isn't it a problem, uh, so Mr Harding, uh, that, yes, uh, psychological claims are more complex and it's more difficult, but the, the, the net result of that is that workers who are injure, injured have psychological injuries get a worse treatment than someone who has physical injury. Like, the, they have to fight harder to actually get compensation, uh, and that's, that's so a fair, we, is we, it? So we 100% agree with you. That's why we're trying to develop a new model with a specialisation of to create a different capability set and a different approach to dealing with site claims. At the moment, we have one sausage machine that all sausages go through. Uh, the specialist model that we're trying to create, uh, so with each of the, the four claim service providers, they'll have different approaches to what that specialisation means, and we'll learn from each of those as, as that goes through. We also intend to work with another partner who we can't talk about yet because they haven't finished the probity processes, but who hopefully can bring in a lot of IP that can help us build uh, and test and learn different approaches to case management to lift that uh, a case manager capability, but also change the way uh, that the process works. And we'd love to come back to the committee and to CIRA uh, with recommendations from those processes about how to change the scheme to make it a psychologically safe scheme. But today, it's a physical scheme attempting to deal with psychological claims. Case managers are, have a complex process to work through. Uh, they don't necessarily have the skills and they're not necessarily set up to do that. Uh, so I, I think the disputation, so we're not disagreeing with your underlying premise at all. We, uh, we are trying to work ways to develop models to improve the outcome. We had some evidence from the round table about workers having to, having to fight with their case managers around appropriate treatment. Sh shouldn't the worker's opinion really be the decisive opinion in terms of the type of treatment that they receive? Uh, look, the, the, like best, that... the best guide for the treatment should be the treating doctor uh, and their recommendations. And that should be the, the key process that the case manager is going through is, is, is working with the treating doctors. And there may be more than one in the case of a psychological injury. Uh, and uh, and agreeing that process with the injured worker, um, so that that's that's the best approach, and that's our preferred approach. But do you have any uh, point of view on that? Do you want to? No, no, I, I support in terms of you know with the I think the the best approach is you know relying on the treating doctor because they actually know the injured worker, they know what they need. Um, we do have. Um, I just wanted to um, let the committee know that we actually have established since 2017 a medical support panel because we do actually have, you know, treating doctors that, you know, uh, might also need support in terms of recommending we get um, referrals for new and novel treatment and, you know, introducing <coughs> new treatment that um, some people aren't aware of. Uh, we've got the we have an independent panel that we've established of um, eleven specialists on the panel. They're occupational physicians and psychiatrists, and we actually um, all the claim service providers can refer to the medical support panel for an opinion. And that's and that's actually over the last several years, they've reviewed over twenty one. I think it's twenty one thousand four hundred and eighty seven. Um, claims that have been referred for that intervention and that's actually 53% of those resulted in a resolution and didn't move on to an independent medical examination. So we're actually doing things in terms of looking at ways where we can um, get that early support, minimise the need for an independent medical examination but really focus on the um, the the advice and the recommendations that are also coming through from the treating doctors, but recognising that sometimes treating doctors also um, are saying that they also need that support as well. So we've got some programs in place to support them. The Chair's been very generous to the opposition and appreciate that. Um, can I just jump in, though? Um, sure. we, we are like that. We're generous. We're... Uh, well, the Chair is, I see. Um, <laughs> and the former Chair. With, with respect um, to this point about not wanting to get down into the weeds, uh, Mr Harding, and I understand uh, as a CEO, getting 
getting down into the weeds is something that um, might have to do from time to time, but prefer to deal with the, the macro issues. But can I j just use this one particular example, and hopefully uh, in terms of the new claims uh, model, um, this is being addressed. But in our evidence we heard today, and it's been actually um, uh, reported back informally, informally, <coughs> in, in other evidence, that um, with respect to the, the making of a claim these days, a workers' compensation claim, um, the, uh, I'll use the phrase, the old school approach was to, to complete a workers' co compensation claim form as the employee who's wanting to make a claim, and the employer themselves would then complete paperwork associated with, with the, the pending claim or the claim to be made. The, the effect of that was that at that point, at that very early point, there was quite comprehensive detail captured quite close to the event or thereabouts about the matter, the matter. Now, I'm not suggesting we return to the, the days of uh, pen and paper because the world's moved on, but the system, as we understand it today, uh, under the legislation, does not mandate or, or require a, a workers' compensation claim form to be completed by the employee and, and nor specifics around the employer in terms of what they need to complete, the result of which it's it's morphed into what is a requirement or, 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 or what is a, a protocol of the lodging of an electronic notification of a claim. Now, you don't need to be, um, not referring to you personally here, but what one doesn't need to, 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 to be surprised um, if I said that just seems to be extraordinary, that people who are going to manage a claim at various intervals over the life of the claim um, do not start with a rich source of information about the claim itself and, and are left trying to, to fill gaps and then get into terrible scenarios whereby the gaps may be so large they've got to circle back and, and circle back and circle back. Now, uh, that just seems to me to be so bleeding obvious that, that, yeah, sure, it's not a macro issue, but if through the legislation, the critical information for the processing of this claim from the employee's point of view and the employer's point of view, and indeed ITS point of view, is having some pretty rich information up front at the start, mm. there's a massive gap there. There's a massive gap there. So I guess my question is, with respect to what, what's been um, in the vernacular referred to as the, the new, new claims model, uh, if I don't mind describing it that way, because others have, with respect to the new, new claims model, is this being addressed? Well, I'm not sure what new, new means, uh, Mr Donnelly. The, um, the thing I would say about that is, and I, I'll pass it to Ms Maynard because she's far more uh, aware of the detail here than I, than I am, but um, I'm, not, I'm not aware that there is that sort of issue that you've raised, and I wasn't uh, participating in the earlier... I was... Uh, occupied with other things, um, sure. the early evidence. So I don't really know the context of the conversation that you've, you've had. Uh, anything where we have built uh, an online portal to enable uh, ease of capture of information for employers and for injured workers has followed the CIRA guidelines in respect to the information to be captured at the time of claim. Uh, and you know, that's then followed up through the, through the case manager with conversations with uh, the relevant parties. Um, so I'm not sure of the, the context, but I'll ask Ms Maynard if she's got any other detail that no, she wants to add. No, um, Mr Donnelly, if, if I could, I wasn't um, privy to, okay. to that conversation either, but what I'd like to do is just highlight in terms of the, um, what we ask in when we're, uh, we've got the notification process is we ask for the name and contact details of the worker, um, the name and contact details of the employer, the name and contact details of the worker's medical practitioner. Um, I'm just reading through in terms of what we've got. Um, the name and contact details of witnesses or anyone, any other witnesses known to the worker if the incident was witnessed description of the injury and how it happened and information to support medical expenses and other losses. So I'm sort of, I'm at a loss trying to understand what the, what the nature of the question was earlier or the issue. We do have an online portal where we're trying to capture um, minimal information quickly. So we, I mean, the important thing for us and for any insurer is to be able to access 
to, for an injured worker and an employer to notify as quickly as possible so that we can trigger the provisional liability um, requirements and help those injured workers. So if there's a barrier, I, you know, I'm happy to take that on notice and provide more information. Or well, we perhaps we could do that in, on notice. Uh, but the issue is minimal information. I think you probably nailed it on the head that, uh, um, uh, th that this is the point. There is minimal information being I'll captured. But, but I think that the question, you know, there's, there was some suggestion about gaps. I don't know what the gaps are. We have information that's necessary for us to process and initi initiate the claim, which is the key. Mm. Uh, and then the conversations can happen with the stakeholders in that claim uh, so that we can capture the rest of the information on, in a much more rich way than on a form. Um, perhaps you were talking to the Lawyers Association who like a lot of forms, but uh, uh, otherwise, unfortunately, we don't have the context of the background, but... And maybe we can. Uh, you can email me, and I can. You could review more the detail, and we can have a look. Perhaps on notice, provide. Yeah, no, response. we can deal with that through notice. Um, Absolutely, yeah, it, it was the lawyers. But can I just say, it's not. They're not the only people or, or um, stakeholder group that's raised this, and it's not just a case of paper for the paper's sake. It's it's capturing information um, um, as, as richly as possible. Yeah. As close to or thereabouts to the actual injury. Um, yeah. So this Look, I think we all agree with the desire to capture that in a, in a timely and valuable way. I think our, our efforts have been focused on both ends of that, which is how to make it easier and simpler for injured people to report a claim uh, and to lodge a claim, uh, as well as trying to get the balance and the information that we capture at that time. So I think um, I think we're doing all of that while, while balancing that within what CIRA's guidelines are. Uh, again, you know, we have legislative prescription, then we have serious guidelines, Absolutely. and uh, all of those things you know, are, are constraints upon what we what we do and don't do. But I'm happy to take it away. That's and, right. No, no. And I think you know, we, we get the point that's being made, so we can always we can take that away and look at it as part of the next next phase of work. And just finally, the claims model um, uh, that, that's being developed, worked up, at what point is that essentially a completed project or is it a uh, work in progress or... So uh, I, I think our view would be it's it's always going to be a work in progress because we don't want to see it stop and stagnate, right? We want it to continue to evolve. Uh, but the current phase of it is is uh, very much a work in progress. We have now appointed the six CSPs that we announced last week. Uh, we can move to implementation of that in 2023 uh, to get those people on board and start to have them allocated capability. Uh, the specialisation around the psychological claims is very much a test and learn uh, kind of approach where we really want to see different methods being used by the claim service providers to try and create that, as Ms Maney said, a more empathetic, robust approach to uh, working with uh, psychologically injured people to, and what works to actually return them to work in the fastest and best possible way. Uh, and we will iterate that through a test and learn process until we can find the right uh, combination of changes uh, and and roll that through the rest of the system as quickly as we can. Uh, so I see it's a, yeah, rather than perhaps what you saw in 2017, and I assume this is what your new, new conversation is about, but yeah, rather than a big bang, one size fits all approach that happened back then, our goal is to learn and test and try new things. And uh, when we identify what is making the biggest impact, then we, we share that across the providers and have them improve the performance of the scheme overall. Uh, now, that's why I keep saying it's going to take time. I don't see big bangs uh, these days. Uh, are really is things that, that work. Uh, we need to trial, understand some things will work, some things won't work. Uh, and you know, we do that in a way that's not, not damaging to the scheme or to people. Uh, and then we, when we find one that does work, we implement it across the scheme and have a performance improvement. I don't know whether I'm answering your question and making any sense or whether you're, uh, no, you're looking, looking, looking through your uh, eyebrows at me. No, I just think. Um, well, and thank you for your frankness on, on, on everything so far. In particular, I think with regarding um, the scheme, um, whilst being very good in terms of um, uh, dealing with physical health problems, might not necessarily be completely perfect um, in terms of psychological claims. Um, so thank you not for uh, for 
for sugarcoating it, for being for being frank. Um, but I suppose there comes a point, um, and I very much appreciate all the work you're doing in, in improving the scheme as, as much as possible. I suppose there comes a point where um, there's only so much that you can do at eye care within the existing legislation and regulations, and eventually um, there's going to have to be reform of the scheme from here in this place um, because there's only so much that you can do yourselves, um, in particular regarding psychological claims. Agreed. So if you, and um, I'm assuming you want an answer, but uh, in, the, in the context of the broader environmental changes that are going around us and the shifting nature of work that's happening, uh, and that's just one shift that's happening in the labour market and in the economy, uh, you know, flexible working, uh, is, you know, in, in professional services, if you take eye care, for example, or any other office-based service kind of organisation, I think uh, globally now, uh, you know, attendance in the office now is running at sort of between 30 and 40% maximum. Uh, so that means you've got, uh, and that's generally, <laughs> that's generally Tuesday to Thursday because no one's in the office on Mondays and Fridays, um, but, but you, you've now got a different scenario. Agree where people in those uh, workplaces are either isolated at home uh, and they have there's a different whole layer to that that we haven't seen play out in the workers' compensation system uh, you know, in terms of how that will impact uh, you know, the nature of work and uh, how people's injuries unfold. So I think uh, we would support uh, legislative reform to support psychological claims and we're very happy to contribute in whatever way we can to that and work with CIRA and yourselves uh, to try and work through that. Uh, we recognise that will be uh, a complex and, and challenging process. Any final questions? I do have questions? a couple of final questions. Okay. I wanted to ask Mr. about Deanna. the customer satisfaction uh, yes. measure. Uh, when is that... Uh, when, when do you actually take the, the uh, feedback? Like where, when, is, when does a worker make... Uh, submit to that process in terms of giving that feedback about customer satisfaction. What At what stage do you take those assessments? But I might need to process? take that on notice for you. I, I can generically say to you, and I'm happy to come back with specific detail on that. So uh, we take soundings on a regular basis. Right? So monthly, Miss Van Sam might actually yep, know the answer. monthly. Do you want to answer it? Oh, we do it at different stages is my understanding, so yeah, we so will do it. Perhaps if you're on notice you can provide some detail about the yeah. stages at which points in the worker journey through the claims sure. process yep. uh, that the, those measures are taken. I wonder if you could also on notice provide uh, the detail of the customer satisfaction level for uh, psychological claims for the last uh, two years. Uh, and then for all other claims, the customer satisfaction level for all other claims for the last two yep. years. Um, so so we just, we're yeah. happy to. Yeah. Um, historically, we haven't measured satisfaction. We've had a, uh, NPS, NPS, which is not a particularly wonderful measure. But oh, we can, okay. we can so provide you what we've so got. So you've changed the measure, have you? We've improved the measure, yes. So, so we've you've moved to a different measure, so you've got no historical oh, we can, reference we've got, point. We've got enough historical to give you a good context. And we've got an ability to align the two so you can see changes. Sure. But the ability to get deep into understanding what affected the NPS in the past is a lot less than what we can do today in he helping understand the drivers of the satisfaction. Okay. Uh, the second thing I wanted to ask was about um, when you talked about the average claim cost, uh, what categories... C can you s break that down into, you know, what proportion is of an average claim is uh, monthly benefit or weekly benefits, medical costs, administration, Absolutely. reputation. Yep, uh, so I was wondering if you could provide uh, that detail, the average claim cost yep. for psychological claims yes. and then for all other claims yep. uh, for the last, I don't know, four years, if that's yep. possible. No. Thank you. That's not, not hard at all. Just one more notice. Yes. Just, last, last, just last, last one. one. Yep. Um, <laughs> thank you. Just on notice. Uh, given who, given the uh, 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 yeah. identification uh, of the significant uh, issue of, of bullying, in particular bullying and harassment, um, um, which is dealt with uh, helpfully in, in the first page uh, of your uh, pre-hearing questions, there's a, a histogram there. 
Um, 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 could you please on notice provide us with, um, I presume, what could be broadly described as a specific strategy document uh, or, or um, approach document that you've prepared and presented to the government to tackle this? I mean, it's... I think that's a, a question that you should refer to Syrah. Well, well, um, uh, I can. We, we, we I, don't have a. Po we don't provide policy recommendations to government. So you, you are. Let me put it this way. So are you essentially silent to government on this issue? We we provide feedback to CIRA, and they provide policy recommendations to government. Right. I'll say it again. You, you don't provide any. Given the dimension of. We don't this, provide policy recommendations to government. Yeah, I do understand that. But yourself, you, um, given the size of this issue, and it's not insignificant. Uh, you have no discussion, it's all up to CIRA to deal with the government. You, you have not in any way engaged with anyone inside government on this matter? Sure. Um, not, not in respect to uh, policy level issues, no. Okay. We, 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 we deal right. with it in terms we, of... We, have, we, we right. have gone over time, so yeah, um, I, will, I will cut it off there. Um, so thank you so much for attending uh, this hearing. Committee members may have additional questions, I'm sure they will, um, for you after the hearing. Um, the committee has resolved that answers to these, along with any answers to questions taken on notice today, be returned within 14 days. The Secretariat will contact you in relation to these questions. Thanks so much for attending, and that concludes our second day of hearings. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.